All right, there we go. Wow. Okay. Uh, goodbye, Adriana. <laughs> Good morning, everybody else. Uh, there are probably going to be other people drifting in, but uh, we do round robin updates, as you will recall. And Craig Hayes is next to me in the uh, in the pictures here. So, Craig, what's up? Hello. Hey, I'm just uh, sort of a guest um, representing Muniz Ranches. We've been working a lot with uh, Judy, the Coast Ridge, um, you know, community forest council uh, and anybody we can work with to keep going with our fuel reduction work. So, uh, you know, in the area, primarily on Muniz Ranch Road, but trying to branch out and work with our other neighbors. Really important. Thank you very much for representing Muniz. Ron uh, Roleri, what's up? Uh, I don't have a whole lot to, other than I'm registered for the conference and I pass it on to friends. So, uh, uh, yeah, we're just waiting. Uh, the Gulala Redwood, uh, Gulala River Watershed Association, we're going to meet coming up next week, I think. So, uh, but yeah, I don't have anything new to add to this. Okay, well, you being here adds a lot in any case. <laughs> Good morning, Jill. Good morning. Hi, how are you? Um, let's see. I, I'm also representing the Lola River Watershed Council um, and the uh, our two part-time staff are putting out the hobo uh, temperature gauges. So we'll start recording water temps here, or I guess we already are. Uh, and on a personal note, the uh, county chipper program is up and running and they came and chipped all my slash for me this week, so. That's, that's you, always an amazing sight. Uh, absolutely, so if you need slash chipped, uh, <laughs> you, can, you can sign up on online and uh, they came out very promptly the last couple of years and also the last couple of years, they will come twice. So if you're industrious and generate more during the course of the summer, they'll come again. It's it's a great program and I'm so thrilled that we have it. And uh, a lot of it's from, from us pushing. Good morning, Miss D. You're on mute, but- I am, oh my goodness. <laughs> Well, good morning. Uh, it is an exciting uh, week uh, for sure. And it's been a lot of fun working uh, all these months on this fantastic conference. Um, and I wonder how many registrants we have so far. Who knows? Adriana knows. Oh, she'll be back. Okay. I checked yesterday and it was over 90. Okay. I looked yesterday and it was at 150. That's what I heard. Um, so I don't know. Maybe oh, I checked a couple. Maybe that was a couple uh, days ago. Yeah. <laughs> Adriana can tell us how we're going to accommodate 150 people. Because <laughs> I was wondering. The, the room Stone can Farm can accommodates 120. Yeah, so we have a hundred. We have one hundred and fifty folks signed up, um, and that includes tablers. And the tablers, yeah, woo. Um, the tablers are going to be in the riding arena. And there's about, um, I think it was something like twenty five. I can't remember off the top of my head. Twenty five, um, or or maybe thirty actual people tabling, but fifteen organizations. So we'll have fifteen tables. And then, you know, about 20, 25 or so of those people will be in the riding arena. And then, so that brings us down to 120 um, ish. And then um, the rest of the, those folks will be in the Schoen Pavilion or Dutton Pavilion, which that's about our capacity for that space. So um, I think we'll be okay. We may, we may flirt a little bit with them, with the max capacity, um, but I think we'll be all right especially since there's only a few parts of the agenda when we're all in the Dutton Pavilion at once. Otherwise, we're kind of indoor, outdoor, um, doing lunch or, or um, the workshops. Um, and just the other thing about um, registration is I went through and looked at um, sort of who's um, attending and um, 
I know our target audience is not necessarily ourselves or even people <laughs> who have been engaged in the force working group. Um, we want new blood, right? We want new people. So I looked at who is like not already a force working group member, who is not um, just a NGO or agency um, employee, um, but people who are landowners, land managers, foresters, interested members of the public, not associated with us. And it's 116. So I felt really good about that number. Um, some of them are familiar, like, you know, some of these people, but you know, that's okay. This conference is for them too. But a lot of them are honestly people I, I don't know who they are and I'm really excited to meet. So um, that's great. Yay. Okay. Thank you everyone for all your work outreaching. Okay. I'll stop there. We great. Thank you so much. That, let's give a shout out or whatever to Adriana. <laughs> wow, 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 wow. What a great um, leader we have. Uh, and she's the right age, you know? <laughs> He's a youngster. Fantastic. I'm getting older, though, with every passing day. Of this well, yes, we, we, we all are, aren't we? And, you know, that's one of the reasons for the conference, because we need to pass the baton to new people, to young people, to people that are less um, uh, able to, uh, you know, take all the time we do to, to do this work. Uh, those that are uh, financially, you know, in a different position. So we really do have a lot of wonderful work uh, ahead of us uh, to do. Um, I want to say quickly that TALS, Taking Action for Living Systems, is uh, we're still working on um, on the financing, the investments, bringing in the private uh, money, how to manage our forests, how to actually um, help uh, landowners uh, make a little bit of money so they can return it to the forest and not go broke because I don't know if many of you actually do uh, forest management on your land or pay for it, but it's expensive. So we really do need to help um, everybody that wants to um, manage. So we're looking forward to encouraging people to do that today. And we're also still interested in seeing how we can add to the um, scale of a situation because all our work, as I say over and over, is fabulous, but it's not enough in terms of scale. We need to encourage that at the conference to uh, get uh, you know more um, collaboration, connections, et cetera. And that's the two things that TALS is working on getting private money to match the, the public money and to find a structure that will allow us all to be more connected. And then in terms of the conference, um, I have my um, three minutes. Uh, I'm spending all week on writing it and practicing it. And the name of the title of it is It Depends. <laughs> and so you guys can just take it from there think about it that's the theme of my my little three minutes and it's really fun to have just three minutes because you have to really make make it count thank you absolutely absolutely thank you d that was that was brilliant um jay what's up <laughs> hello all um, well, I'm in my second month of uh, being ED here at the Sonoma RCD. Thank you, Ron and Fred, for uh, being kind enough to hire me. Uh, um, yeah, I'm definitely drinking from the fire hose, but lucky enough, I'm a, a diver, so I can pull the hose away and take a breath when I need to. Um, it's going well. I'm, I'm really excited about it. The, the team really knows what they're doing over here. Um, right. On the, the personal side of things, I'm a little concerned about flash fuels this year because um, most of the smaller producers like myself, I know, sold a, some animals off because we didn't have feed for them. And I uh -huh. can't keep up with my uh, grass right now by a long shot. It's going to be months before I'm, I'm at a place that I feel comfortable. Um, but even the folks that didn't sell, that, that fed through the, the uh, drought, are, are really having a hard time. So what we're doing here is more important than ever because it's, uh, it's a little scary out there right now when things start drying out. You know, Che, I, you're reminding me of having something on the agenda uh, for next meeting or so, and that is how can we help 
these uh, producers? Uh, how can maybe there's a fundraiser? There has to be some way to make it worth their while not to go out of business and to actually thrive. So I'd like to have that on the agenda at some point. Let's let's do what we can to to help financially. My morning meeting was all about that, D. So thank you. It was uh, you know Malt, the Marin RCD, Sonoma, and Gold Ridge, and all of us in the county trying to figure out how to prepare for the next one. So. Good, good thinking, and and uh, I will continue to report back. Oh, and speaking of grazing, um, Goldridge and Sonoma did get a uh, grant to continue our Landsmark grazing program, so that's really exciting, and we'll be bringing that back with an announcement at some point. And speaking of Sonoma RCD, you guys are, are administering the NB FIP project, uh, and there's a lot of lot of new people coming in that way. I, I often get a phone call and. Could, can I come out there and touch the ground with with the folks? So I really appreciate that. Well, to, to clarify on that one, it's going to go to Conservation Works. They're administering it as the fiscal agent, and Gold Ridge and Sonoma RCD are going to be doing the, the contracting work for it. I meant that. Yeah, there you <laughs> go. <laughs> Thanks, Rick. <laughs> Eric, Eric Shoes. Uh, good morning. Good morning, all. Uh, I represent Sonoma Ecology Center. Um, I can mostly speak to what I've been working on, which is the handbook um, for principles and practices vegetation management in Sonoma County and getting very excited for the conference as well. We're all registered up and kind of trying to coordinate with with people to make sure that, um, you know, that project gets out there and, and people get excited about it, uh, distilling a lot of the knowledge from people that are in this room and making it accessible to the public so they can make the correct decisions on their land um, for them to you know take care of the land in in a more wholesome perspective and not just for fire not just for water retention but biodiversity <clears throat> and, and general health of the land so yeah that's been going really well and then as far as sonoma ecology center goes um i will let caitlin answer that when she comes up she's a little more tuned into the rest of our organization but Nonetheless, very excited uh, for this conference coming up. Uh, thank you for your excitement. It's great to have that as we pass the baton. Mr. Jason Mills. Hey guys, I feel like it's been a while, but I hope to see you all at the conference. I'm super excited for it. Um, we have been busy as ever, uh, WRA trying to spare, you know, damage to the land and do the work well. and. You know, just to Dee's point, like, it's interesting, you know, the costs of doing this work, right? And then the benefits of doing this work. And what is the cost of poor work and the benefit of good work? You know, it gets into some interesting environmental economics there, right? And it's outside of the conventional box. Like, are we saving by skimping and paying young people next to nothing to do brutal work that are completely uninformed practices that are going to increase fuels in the long run. I mean, this is a, a sort of situation <laughs> where we're looking at. So, you know, I would just love to, if we could all make sense of it, and I feel like we have been in this group. So here we go. We've got a conference to do it. So I'm excited to try to be a voice of reason through this technical workshop with Tori out there and I think we'll have some good concepts but you know being part of the TAC and helping Kim out with you know trying to allocate the funds the best we can and, and everything and you know I mentioned that my dream is you know we're looking at the wildfire hazard index pointing to you know the value of all these structures and the value of the environment and where we should be doing the work and it all points to the wooey areas you know, these wooey areas are span everywhere from completely degraded lands to really important sensitive habitat. And uh, I just don't see that sort of consideration being really weighed in when we allocate our resources. We have too few resources to begin with, so there's plenty of work for everybody. So maybe we could just put the right resource to the right project. And that's kind of a dream of mine. And you look out there, the hand crews, we got tree crews, great with the woody stuff. Don't know a thing about the understory, not supposed to, right? They're tree people. The next you got the 
job training programs. They're learning. They're good. You can save some money, but we probably don't want to put them in sensitive habitat with high level of plant ID and technical needs. And you got the heavy handed equipment folks out there um, just ready to chomp at it. And I mean, just having a huge impact. Like I talked to one guy, said he went through 30 masticator blades taking out manzanita. And that just made me tremble to think of the amount of damage that that did. And it paid for, it. paid for by, by us. And, uh, and anyhow, so, and then there's the grazing animals. Can't forget about the grazing animals. Let's put them in the right place and, and really go after all these fine fuels. And Che, I'm so with you. The invasives are raging. And, you know, if we could just, if we could just marry vegetation management and look at ecological restoration and fire fuel reduction and convince the powers that be that they go hand in hand. They are not separate things. <laughs> and, uh, and you know, the cost, it's basically the same. I just, I don't know. Anyhow, we <laughs> protect our community and the environment can be done. And uh, I've taken too long, so I'll move on. No, no. Listen, J Jason, what I want to say, please tell your... Uh, company, especially Virginia, how uh, valuable uh, your presence has been. And I think there's another staffer that helps us as well, because not many companies, you know, are, are uh, helping enough and you guys are. So would you please take that message back to your cohorts? Thanks. Absolutely, Dean. Can't wait to hear your talk. It does depend. <laughs> and that was a really good rant, and um, I'm looking forward to the responses to be in the book that Sonoma Ecology uh, is putting together, where you can see the, the transition between small and large. We're more there later. Good morning, Caitlin. How are you? Hey, everybody. Very well. Very nice to be among you. Um, um, I just, uh, I'll just add one more thing to what Eric was talking about. It's, well, I guess two more things. Um, the Resilient Landscapes Coalition that focuses on defensible space, but really is out there teaching people about the same, very similar principles that go out further in the landscape is carrying on. Um, we got, we got another um, grant from the Veg Management Program, so that will help take the message further. Um, and there's a workshop coming up that we're going to partner with Sonoma RCD on in Mark West, I believe. I can't actually keep track of all that stuff. Um, uh, but we have a, a good new ish staff person who's working on um, kind of that defensible space, like around the house area. Uh, Bob Schneider is really skilled. Um, and then I also wanted to mention that we are writing a grant proposal with um, doing something sort of new that I thought you might want to hear about because um, it sort of reflects a couple of larger trends. We are partnering with La Luz Center, which is the largest Latino serving nonprofit in Sonoma Valley. Um, <laughs> so that's sort of unusual that we would partner with them on a, a kind of technical grant because we haven't done projects like that with them before. We've done education stuff with them before. Um, and we're applying to a novel funder, EPA. EPA, like so many of the public environmental funders, is earmarking more and more of their money for disadvantaged communities. And uh, one of the census tracts in the in the valley that represents the springs is lighting up on EPA's map. Um, and so we're applying to bring the JC's fire resilient landscaping certification program to Sonoma Valley in Spanish at La Luz um, and recruiting, the idea is to recruit uh, people, men mostly, who are mostly Latino, mostly Spanish speaking, who are in, in the sort of largely informal and badly paid like landscaping day labor um, field and give them the certification. And then also La Luz has this whole small business development program already, so we'll help connect them with employers and jobs and build their small businesses. So, you know, from, from the perspective of people in this room, uh, you know, we need a much larger land, uh, workforce that's skilled, that's knowledgeable, that's sensitive, that has all the perspectives that we want them to have. 
Um, and the Spires Landscaping Program from the JC is quite adaptable. And so we're planning to stock that experience with lots of the ideas that are gonna be in the handbook and that, that Jason was just ranting about. Um, uh, so we hope that it gets funded. And I just wanted to mention it because it's just very interesting now how the, the justice and uh, wildland health parts of our Sonoma County community are coming together. North Bay Jobs as Justice is doing a lot more on wildland work. Um, so I think it's a very interesting confluence. Thanks. Amazing, just wonderful. Uh, Robert Aguero, how are you? Hi everyone. Um, yeah, uh, I don't think I have too much to update this group on that I haven't probably talked about with this group already in the past. Um, uh, the, the tree ordinance survey, we have received your comments. I understand um, some of this group's uh, consternations about that survey, and I hear that, and I appreciate that. Um, so I look forward, I believe the survey closes today, and so I look forward to seeing all of those responses. Um, but right now we're meeting with some other stakeholders, and we have planning commission meetings tentatively scheduled for uh, August and September, and then a board date is scheduled for the end of November. Um, so I'm sure I'll be here again to update you on that once we move a little further down the process. Um, I look forward to uh, speaking at the working group conference next Friday. Um, that'll be fun. I'm looking forward to seeing a lot of you there. Um, thanks for the opportunity. Um, but no, not, not much uh, permit to Noma's end. So yeah, appreciate the opportunity to be here. Well, you're not much as a heck of a lot to us. Thanks for the update. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Fred. <laughs> Esther, uh, what, what's going on? Hi, everyone. I'm just here to um, actually, I hate, hate to say it, but I'm here for Marshall's update. That's <laughs> But, but it's great to hear about the conference. I'm sorry I'm not going to be able to make it. I, I wish I could, but I'm going to be out in the field. But um, yeah, I'm just here to get updated from all you guys' stuff. It appears that you're invading Ukraine soon from the map. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Keep us posted. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, actually, I'll be helping them out. <laughs> oh, David Shatkin, good morning. Um, good morning. I'm also here to listen to uh, Chief Turbeville's update. Great. But interesting information. So thank you all. Yeah, it's always fun. Uh, Molly O'Brien. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. I'm having connectivity issues, so I'm going to be off camera. But um, thanks for having us. And uh, I'm bummed that I missed Jason's rant. I, I love those things. <laughs> Oh, I'm, I'm sure you'll hear it again. <laughs> I, oh, I, I, I know I will. I don't think uh, you have a choice. Yeah, I don't have a choice. But I'm looking forward to the conference next week, looking forward to seeing all of you or most of you in person. The one other thing that I wanted to add in terms of what WRA is up to is that uh, we are supporting the County Administrator's Office's Climate Action and Resilience Division on their community engagement and stakeholder engagement effort to inform the Municipal Operations Climate Action Resilience, or uh, yeah, Climate Action Resilience Plan. So we just started this week. It's really exciting to be a part of that effort and how it, you know, correlates and complements what you all are working, doing, and working in this group. And there's a couple of other interesting, fun things that are re regarding relevant topics with some of the folks on this call that I can't quite share yet, but they're in the works. And maybe even by the conference, there might be more ability to share more. So that's my quick up update. Wonderful. Thank you, Molly. Hey, Sophia. Hi there. Oh, my camera is out, so I don't. Anyways. Okay. Uh, anyways. We know what you're <laughs> Good to see all of you. <laughs> I'm sorry you can't see me. I'll try and figure out what's going on with that. Um, hi, um, mostly here to hear Marshall and kind of keep my ear to the ground of things going on and also um, I am volunteering I think for the conference at least on Thursday to help out with the setup and things like that um, and just you know happy to hear different updates. Um, not sure I have anything super relevant to this group um, at this moment um, except maybe working with Tori which is the fire advisor up north 
well, for the three counties, Marin, Noma, Noma <laughs> Sonoma, and Napa, um, um, maybe helping her with doing some research and things like that. So um, yeah, good to be here. Keeping it brief, <laughs> trying to keep on time. <laughs> there we go. Mar Marshall, I see that you've engaged, you joined the conversation, but I'm gonna let you, I'm gonna give you a whole half hour in a second. <laughs> Uh, okay, well, I gotta get. Yeah, just let me give me a heads up because I gotta get my PowerPoint ready too. Okay, uh, I believe you're on at ten thirty. Is that correct, Adriana? Um, yeah, he can start whenever he's ready to. Ten thirty is good. I think that's what works best for him. Um, and then Fred, I, I have an update too that I wanted to share before we transition out of updates. Okay, and my update is. Um, I've been approached by um, Biswell Forestry to put together a series of um, forest uh, classes, forestry classes for their workers. And this might uh, fit into your stuff, Caitlin, as well. Just uh, we have all these people working in the forest who are, they know a lot about the machines and the equipment, but they don't know much about forestry. So they don't have the overarching um, skills that will make them a forest technician by the time they're done. And um, so this would be for that, and it'll be probably be a series of about half a dozen classes moving around the county in an experiential classroom, mm. with a pop-up classroom approach. Um, so I'm very excited about that. I'll also probably be working with the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, and I'm uh, struggling with CAL FIRE on yeah, forms. What the hell? Don't try Caltrees. It'll just eat your data. Okay, that's my update. <laughs> Adriana, your turn. Okay. Um, so a couple of things that are just forest working group related that I wanted to pop into the conversation before we get swept away with a great presentation from Marshall and then lost in conference conversation after that. Um, one is that we have another presentation scheduled for July. I just wanted to plug to everyone. It will be um, from Ryan Plausch from State Parks. He's gonna talk about what projects State Parks are doing in Sonoma County. So um, he's primarily on the coastal parks, but he and um, he'll get an update from the interior parks on what's kind of happening across the county. So that should be really interesting to hear about. Um, also in July, I will be gone. So I'll be looking for someone else to host that meeting. Um, I'll be taking some vacation and time off. Um, so um, if anyone would like to do that, just let me know. Otherwise, I'll reach out to you um, in uh, uh, on the side. And then the other, other thing that I wanted to say was um, with the conference, we've had just an uptick in engagement with the Forest Working Group, which is really exciting. Um, and just um, really warms my heart and also, but also requires us to step up and do a little bit more. And so um, one of those things that, uh, one of the requests that I got from a few members of the public was for more information on, um, on resources and an interest in what we used to call house meetings. So I don't, I've never been to one of these, but back in the day, the forest working group would do something called a house meeting, which was where um, members of the forest working group would attend a private landowner's uh, neighborhood meeting. And they would go and say, hey, your neighborhood is interested in forestry activities. Let's you know, have a conversation about what's kind of appropriate for your neighborhood, what you guys are interested in doing, what you wanna learn about. And it was very, very personal, um, awesome service. And so there are a couple of people who are interested in that. Um, I sent those to uh, Jill and Fred, who I think used to do the house meetings in the past, and also Tori Norville, who's been doing a ton of um, TA um, from UC. And it sounds like Tori is good to um, run with scheduling one of those. I have another one that I need, need to still pass on to her in that group. But if anyone wants to be involved in that, please let us know that um, that's something that, you know, that's a way to, to give back to the community and a really kind of fun way to meet other people um, where they're at and uh, provide them with some good info. So um, I believe Tori's going to be heading that up, but just a just heads up that that's coming. Um, who here had has participated in house meetings in the past? I'm just curious. Fred? D? Did you do them? You're on mute. What was the question? 
Did you ever do a house meeting for the forest working group in the past? Oh, not yet, but I, I sign up. And Jill, Jill's done them. Okay. Sounds like just Jill and Fred. All right. Do you, can you guys um, give us a quick one sentence synopsis on what those are? Or did I, did I hit it with my oh. description? Um, you are invited by a group to go to a place on the Russian River, uh, like Rio Nido or um, uh, the, 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 the Oddfellows Grove, and you look around and you see the worst possible situation for fire in the world. And their houses are all tucked up inside these, these uh, columns of forests, and you try to say something that is going to make them feel better. Because uh, <laughs> they're terrified of fire and you see that the trees are crowding their houses most terribly. I'm, wait, I'm being a little facetious here. Um, you get the people in a room and you say, these are the important things. Here's the Carol Leone talk. Here's my talk. Here's these other uh, possibilities. And it's really great that you're involved. Now, let's talk about individual houses. Let's talk about what we really never want to see. And then you, you start using Rio Nido as an example uh, of a community that can't really get safe in its wooey without something that's going to look like a clear cut around houses. And I don't know quite, they're, they're tough meetings in that way. Mm. Okay, interesting. Yeah, that's a little different than I had had imagined where we were going and meeting the landowners at their own neighborhood, but you're talking about inviting them to come and- No, no, I was invited to Rio Nido. Oh, got and, it, got it. We did a big meeting in the park and we looked at everybody's house from one side. Oh, great. And wow. there's a little, little park in the middle of Rio Nido. And everybody says, that's my house. And you see that it's got 24 to 30 to 48 inch redwoods all within 12 feet of it. And it's, you know, their big issue is how do I keep branches from falling on my roof? And, and you start going through, well, you know, there, there's arborists, there's foresters, there's these programs and there's these programs and, you know, uh, there's Cal Fire. So you try and just roll the whole ball into one sort of 20 minute presentation and see where they are the most appropriate. Obviously you don't tell them about public funding sources for, for public stuff. And you don't, tr oh, and you tell them not to hurt themselves. <laughs> you, <laughs> you tell yeah, them. All the, all the fire prevention work out in West County, I mean, those redwood trees, they're built to hold water. Like they capture water from the top, they soak the ground. They have the longest fire return interval of any ecosystem in California. It just, it seems to be a strange place to put our efforts into thinning wet forest land for fuel reduction. I just, I worry about it. You know, I, I, I think the fur thinning is good, but man, do I see a lot of damage going on in the redwood forest where I just wonder if it would even ever burn. Um, we had uh, in 2020, we had the, the Wallbridge fire. Oh yeah. I took out that went all the way to Armstrong Woods. True. That. Mm -hmm. We simultaneously had um, the fire on the coast, which mm -hmm. burned a whole bunch of stuff, Myers fire. Mm -hmm. um, so so my, my vision is clearing out uh, understory fuels, making the houses fire safe, um, and being aware of evacuations. And I kind of start with that and start with the obvious like, I yeah. know all your firewood is under your deck. Yeah. I know yeah. all your decks all over. So I just wonder daylighting, is that just going to increase fuels? You know? Uh, this is maybe a, a, an off uh, line discussion, but my general <laughs> feeling is that daylighting in the redwood forest allows, uh, particularly pulling material away from the uh, younger redwoods allows the fire to pass through in a more quote natural way, way. So we don't burn up the trees and we don't create allow for, for fire pockets in the trees. I've taken too much time. No, oh, yeah, totally. No, I'm sorry. I, yeah, I didn't mean to open a can of worms, but we do. I don't want to take too much time from Marshall. So oh, I'm going to. Jill, hold on. Oh, Jill. Jill. Uh, and I'll I'll try and keep it brief just to uh, get back to um, the the one request 
from Adriana that uh, she forwarded to me. Um, it's a group on West Side Road somewhere. Uh, they had uh, pretty sophisticated uh, gender requests that I would say is really in line with the uh, forest stewardship uh, workshop. Because uh, in addition to wanting to know about uh, fuels reduction and fire safety, they wanted um, to know about things like um, creek care and erosion control, managing forest roads. So uh, it re really sounds like uh, like a full forest stewardship workshop, and I'm going to try and and steer Tori and that landowner uh, in that direction. So and and uh, many of you will be hearing uh, requests for your time to help. Okay, uh, and Devin joined us. Hi, give us the 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 thirty second pepperwood update. Um, June twenty seventh, we have a grassland prepared burn planned, um, and we'll be doing a tour at the um, uh, conference coming up. And I think other than that. We have some goats. We're doing some brush production with gross First time we're doing that in a number of years. So that's basically all I got. They're, they're all chase old goats. <laughs> I want to know about goats. Marshall, are you ready? The mute button. Yeah, I'm ready. Assuming my internet holds up. Is everything good? Can you guys see everything? I'll share a screen here in a minute. We can't even see you, Marshall. <laughs> good. <laughs> I, thank you i'm sure my powerpoint work in here <laughs> uh, can you see powerpoint um uh if you want to see me i cannot see it uh adriana can you give them the screen um you you are screen sharing but it's just blank right now oh there, we there go. it goes we got it how about now Okay, I'm going to turn the view of me off because I'm sitting in a vehicle at a prescribed burn. So not exciting. <laughs> um, let's think it's out of control. I'll turn the video on for you guys. Trust me. Uh, so I'll just give a quick uh, 2023 fire season outlook. Um, I've already done one of these this year about a month ago for uh, firefighters. And is my internet going to hold up? So far, so good. Your internet's holding up. You'll want to go to individual slides. Cool. Slideshow button. Can you guys see it now? You guys, there's slides, right? We, we see multiple see, slides. We see nine slides right now. Uh, that's interesting. Okay, let me restart my PowerPoint then. For some reason, it's down at the bottom. There, there we you go. go. <laughs> How about Is it any better now? Nope. No. Nope. Just give it a moment to load. All right. Well, how about you guys keep doing? Because on okay. my screen, all I'm seeing is one one slide. So I don't know why it's showing you guys nine slides. Hit share again. Okay. Our first uh, ever. <laughs> now, okay, it's it's swarming up. You got one. I think it'll show in a second. It's probably just a little bit of a slow connection. Yeah, let me let me drive my vehicle. I think I had coverage for you guys are doing on. Should we give you a couple of minutes? Okay, all right. Why don't we? Um, oh, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you there, Marshall. We haven't heard from Sasha yet. Yeah, let's take a minute to just um, give give him a sec to relocate. And Sasha, did you join? Awesome. Do you want to give us a one of your brown robin updates? Oh yeah. Sure. <laughs> uh, just uh you know you're, yeah you're not on the hook for anything we're just <laughs> oh no no I, I, I i'm sorry i was late i was you know 
working on conference stuff. That's kind of, you know, kind of all about that right now. <laughs> and I assume you already kind of gave the update and um, did you, uh, you know, we actually are going to do conference at the um, at the end of the meeting after okay, conference. So uh, we can, we yeah. can show them kind of the cleaned up um, documents, which I think will be helpful. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'll I'll defer to to that that point unless Marshall, we're trying to. Oh, there we go. We got a good uh, full slide, Marshall. Nice. Okay. Yeah, that's great. I think I got it figured out. Then it was mainly just an inter internet problem. So we got a full slide. You guys can hear me. Yep. Yes. Okay, so um, this plays off a PowerPoint I did about a month ago for uh, firefighters at uh, the May update. So I updated it a little bit since then. You're my second audience for the season. So uh, this is the 2023 fire season outlook. Mainly looking at a little bit about weather, but also where our vegetation is at um, and its availability to, to burn. So just a little recap and a to demonstrate some trends, um, this is the CAL FIRE statistics. So mainly where CAL FIRE has jurisdiction. So not every fire in this, but a majority of the fires. Um, the last five years, as far as how many acres have burned. Um, and we know in Sonoma County, 2017 uh, was, a, was a bad year for homes burning down. Uh, 2019 was a bad year for acres with the Kincaid fire, the last fire in the county's recorded history and the most evacuations. Matter of fact, a majority of the acres statewide that year were, were burned in Sonoma County. And then in 2020, that was a, a landmark year in, in our recent history because that's when we hit 4 million acres. And we um, had both the LNE Lightning Complex, and Fred was just talking about the Wall Bridge and the Myers on the coast in the Redwood Forest, and then also the, the glass con or the glass fire um, late in the year. And then we've gone into um, peace times, if you will, in 2022 with a pretty slow season. And, um, you know, kind of, I think 2023 in general is going to be a slower season too. So um, we're not having the, the ignitions to date yet. So I'm just going to cover this, but this kind of gives you some perspective, you know, uh, of where we've been the last four to five years with acres burned and then also the amount of structures burned. Um, so Cal Fire maintains three lists, the largest, the destructive, destructive and the most deadliest um, there's been no change in 2022 uh, there was no new fires that qualified for any of these lists so our destructive largest and deadliest remain the same and the reason i i bring this up or I like to show you is it's the trend it's the historical trend um you know we don't have all the data from millions of years but in our best recorded data this shows us trends and so uh, these are our largest fires um usually they're pretty remote um maybe hard to access there's not a lot of lives or structures at risk so they're more of a managed fire a lead in the fire burn to a, a fuel break a road um, versus aggressively suppressed so these are our largest fires unless it's really windy and then wind driven fires always uh, make firefighters less effective. Here's our most destructive. So this is more the homes that start near homes or around homes, uh, usually not a lot of acres. Uh, Oakland Hills being an example, not a lot of large acre fire, but very destructive. And those also tend to be the most deadliest because that's where people are at. And so campfire, um, it sets the records on everything other than acres burned. Um, because it, it burned into the community of Paradise and Concow and such in Butte County. And this is, I think I've shared it with this group before, but this is um, this is what the trends say. So across the top is largest, most destructive and deadliest. Down the left side there is about the ignitions. That's the top half of this table. And then the bottom half is the month of the year. So if you look, our largest fires tend to be lightning caused eight and a half out of, uh, it's a half because he, there was uh, uh, part of it in 2020 uh, uh, with the LNU lightning was an arson part of it in there too. So that's why it's a half of a fire, uh, but eight and a half out of 20 fires um, were lightning caused and they start in July or August. So early in the summer, early in the season, they have multiple months to burn with dry weather before rains and such. So our largest fires would be starting here in the next month. I um, mean, with snow on the ground, um, cooler, moist air, at least so far in Sonoma County, um, less likely that that type of large fire is going to happen. And then if we work our way over to the most destructive and deadliest, you know, nine out of 20 are power lines or electrical related. 
and the deadliest is under other because that's the lumping of all the other possible causes uh, with seven. And you see those are our fall fires, the October fires, normally a wind driven uh, catastrophic weather, you know, uh, multiple fires at one time where firefighters are not effective. So this is what the trend shows us. Our largest fires start early um in the year and lightning cause most destructive start near homes usually where there's power lines um and this is what it is as far as the facts go um so this this worst fire season ever um you know it's kind of become a term we unfortunately joke about um and i know my agency cal fire is is out there talking about all the grass that grew um this could be the worst fire season because of that um but remember, this presentation is, is more focused on Sonoma County. And because I like math, I, I talk really breaking it down. What's what's possible versus what's probable. Every year we can have a fire. Any day of the year we can have a fire. But how bad is it going to be? How realistic, like percentage-wise, is it going to be? So this whole thing about potential versus probable. And then we don't even know what normal is. And then how do we even define worst? Because the 300 people that lost their homes last year, I'm pretty sure that was the worst fire season ever for them, but maybe not for everybody else. So it's really, I don't think of a fair term to use. And ultimately what it comes down to is we have a decreased probability in my opinion this year because of the current weather we've had coupled with the spring weather and also the, the predictions about the next month or so. But you look also statewide with snow, uh, some areas may not may have snow all summer long and may not be available to burn. Uh, on a side note, my son works for the Forest Service. He's over by Yosemite and Stanislaus National Forest doing some of the prescribed burns over there. Um, I think he, where he's camping right now has snow. So you got that type of variable in play across the across the state, um, but not so much in in um, in Sonoma County. But we do have some increased probability locally because yeah a lot of our county sonoma county the mostly the oh shoot i think we lost him hmm. he'll probably come back there he is just give him a moment i'm sure we got to get him one of those Starlinks. Am I back with you guys at least on share screen, or is it? Uh, you're gonna have to restart share screen, but we but you, we can hear you. Right. That's good. Where? Yeah. Where did I cut out at? What, what part? Uh, your son's in um, Yosemite area camping. It's snowy. Yeah. yeah. So that then what I was talking about there is that's what's going across the state with the snow. Um, and then I was transitioning into locally here um, because of the snow we had at low elevations, the wind damage in our forested areas. There's a lot more logs and vegetation on the forest floor, um, which could produce more resistance to control, more heat, uh, more problems such like that. And then we also have the variable that we have a lot of burned lands in the last couple of years that have been potential some of them logged, some of them just kind of been let go, the Oakland. Um, and so there's that variability too. But speaking of weather, um, here's what the predictions are for the weather. Um, on the left there was this released yesterday on June 14th regarding temperature and precipitation. And this comes out of the, the national modeling. And you can see that at least for temperature, um, nothing red there. So it's, we know it's not going to be warmer than normal. And matter of fact, it's on the outer edges of that blue. So there's a greater potential, but we're going to have not the very, you know, heat wave, long duration, multiple day fire scenario. Um, maybe a fire starts in an afternoon, but then the fog comes in at night or it's cool weather and it cools down. So that's about the temperature on top. And then we also have uh, the precipitation at the bottom, which um, you can see it's about average for um, for what it looks like on the six to 10 day. And then five days prior on June 9th, they had uh, also a temperature and a, and a precipitation outlook. So nothing showing really warm weather, nothing showing really wet weather for us. Um, and honestly, it appears that the bullseye has been moved to the north of us in Canada, and, and we're now in more of a, a wet, cool pattern, um, which is good for us, but bad for other folks. And so this is also then 
represented at the at the across all of Northern California, what's called the North Ops Regional Outlook. That you see those three panels up in the upper left there that talk about um, June, July, and August. And this green color means a below normal potential for a large fire. So right now, June for our area of Sonoma County and most of the coast is in a green. I, I don't think in my, ever since they've been doing this, that I've seen our area classified as a below normal potential. So below normal potential for a large fire in June for our area. You see then in July, the green's removed. It's a normal. And then also August or September is a normal. You don't see the red or the above normal. In the drought years um, where we didn't have a lot of rain in the winter, things were very dry. The logs were dry. The dead vegetation was dry. You were seeing the above normal. So right now the outlooks are uh, across all of Northern California, nothing's above normal through, through September. And I'll have a slide here coming up in a little bit, but Really, once we get past mid-September, that's how I define the end of the normal, traditional, historical fire season. It really gets down to wind events, and does it rain first, or does it get windy first? And in 2022, it rained first. So any wind after the rain wasn't that big of a deal. Other years, we never got the rain, like in 2017, so the wind was a big deal. So it's kind of like a race. Is it going to rain first, or is it going to be windy first? And so good news here is the outlook right now at the at the um, northern region, northern California is all, is below average. So that just begs the question, then what do we need for significant fires? And if you guys have heard me talk in previous years, you, you probably know the answer. Um, it's been what we, we've experienced. Um, unfortunately, good or bad, we need the ignition. And so you can see in 2023, the ignitions are at 1,639. Uh, the five-year average at this date, of, of June 12th would be uh, 2,507. So there's 900 less ignitions roughly. When I did this presentation a month ago, we were less than 50%. We had a 50% reduction in ignitions. So this means maybe there is lightning, but it's not starting a fire because there's rain or it's hitting an area with snow or doesn't get reported and burns itself out. Uh, this is people not mowing at the wrong time of the day and starting a fire. Uh, this is someone not dragging a chain, things like that. So. Ignitions are down, which tells me, yeah, people may be being, being safe, but the vegetation's just not ready to burn yet. It's not cured yet. You'll see a slide coming up. The vegetation is a heat sink, meaning it absorbs the heat, absorbs the ignition versus contributing or a heat source. And at some point in the summer, that's going to change from a heat sink, absorbing heat, to producing heat. And so ignitions are down. So if you want to back all this stuff up in science, this is why ignitions are down. Um, usually, small vegetation, think about kindling, thinking about lighting a piece of newspaper to get larger logs burning. Um, the size and shape of the fuels, our, our grass is still relatively green, or where it has cured and where we're burning today is pretty well cured. Fire in Lake County, the Henderson fire was not as well cured, so it didn't burn that well in the grass. So we need our fuels, our light flashy fuels, one hour fuels, whatever you like to call them, we need them available to be ignited. Um, how they're compact or how they're arranged, and that talks about like a shaded fuel break or ladder fuels or breaking up continuity, defensible space around a building or around or along a road, fuel moisture content, how much water is in the vegetation, and then their fuel temperature. So that's a lot of it's based on weather. Um, just to point out, this is SRJC shown farm prescribed burning done back in February this year. As an example, the pine needles at the base of this pine tree uh, burned, but the green grass didn't burn. So it was great. Um, you know, problem with firefighters burns is a firefighter would look at this and be like, well, everything didn't burn. So it was kind of pointless. The reality is this is a great prescribed burn because now we can come back and burn the grass or do another prescribed burn. And a lot of that pitch and a lot of pine needles around the base of the tree are not there. So it's really setting up for a future. I think Brian is on and I heard Fred talk. Uh, this is setting up for a future great prescribed burn. But this showing uh, still moisture, wet, didn't burn, but other vegetation is, is available to burn. And so as we get more and more into summer, um, everything we see here is the total fuel loading, which is multiple tons per acre. But what will burn right now or the available fuel loading is, you know, probably less than one ton per acre. It's the pine needles and stuff. So this is getting into, yeah, you can have ignition, 
but it's not going to be a catastrophic fire. And fire is not a binary event, a tremendous amount of diversity. So um, this is the ignition, um, but not everything's burning. So to get this catastrophic uh, bad fire, um, you know, if, if you're in your house or at work and worrying about whether you should evacuate or not, I've tried to kind of put some new terms to this. I've, I've since about 2015, I've always tried to talk about this one bad afternoon or really one bad night because a lot of our fires happen at night. But it's this fire that starts and it basically spreads faster than firefighters can mobilize. Maybe it's a wind driven, maybe it's not reported right away, maybe it's multiple fires. So there's always a potential, even today, this afternoon, the fog burns off, the one bad afternoon fire where it burns two or three hours, does a lot of damage. Um, I know we were just talking, we we're talking about Guerneville, but some of those canyons worry me because a house could catch fire and they can up that hillside going house to house and also burn some vegetation. But it's just going to be one bad afternoon, really chaotic. Um, that's that one bad afternoon type scenario. Um, potential, there is going to be that type of fire potential. If everyone's safe in the afternoon, doesn't start fires in the afternoon, no fires happen. A fire does happen in the afternoon cooler marine fog there comes in at night we we get around the fire at night we stop it so that's kind of our normal Sonoma county fire history if a fire is in a remote location we need to worry about how to access it but then we got to worry about where we're going to stop it and so the benefits of roads and shitty fuel lakes and defensible space it all helps with that type of fire scenario that's in a remote location Otherwise, we're relying upon air tankers to slow the fire down, and they may not always be able to get retardant on the ground. And there's some controversy. There's always been controversy about, you know, retardant as far as environmental damage that surfaced again this year, but retardant not be able to hit the ground. And then we get very destructive with our bulldozers trying to stop a fire because we're not in a, a fire management or letting the fire burn to an area where we can control it. So that's the remote fire not a good place to stop it wall bridge we could have a lot of ignitions at once maybe lightning maybe arson maybe someone drags their chain maybe it's very critically dry that gets hard for us because we've got to divide all the firefighting resources up and someone's always going to come out on the short end um, which plays into that four bullet point is there enough firefighters available um and so last year's mosquito fire that was the most catastrophic fire in California last year, if I recall correctly, other than the two fires in Siskiyou and the fire down in Riverside, the Fairview fire. But there was enough firefighters to jump on that fire so you didn't see it become a Caldor fire that burned into Tahoe. Uh, then the weather also operated too with moisture. Uh, we could have the one uphill fire run, which kind of plays into the one bad afternoon fire. And then we have our, our worst case scenario, the wind driven fire that has all the embers, embers landing ahead of the edge advancing edge of the fire, uh, jumping control lines were not that effective. And uh, just real quickly with this photo here in the background, this is Scott Burn uh, earlier back um, late May that I helped with out 128 out by the Monticello Dam. Uh, this is an area that's grazed, an area that gets a lot of fire. Roadside starts. Uh, this fire road is put in that you see the fire trucks on, and we're we're doing a prescribed burn to burn the grass and burning down to 128. And you guys, I don't know if you notice it, but, but my cursor or my pointer showing up where the firefighters are standing. Some of this stuff is not even burning. Um, and and the big reason is there's some green grass in here, but this is a grazed area. So just the cattle by by grazing. Um, by just walking everywhere, there's not a lot of grass on the dirt to even carry the fire. So it's very hard for the area to burn. Plus, it's been burned multiple years, so there's no Medusa head or any other invasives. And so it's really a struggle now to get this area to burn. And to me, that's just indicative of where we're at in the fire season with ignitions, um, with not a lot of large fires yet, even grass fire yet. Things are just not to that point of burning well. And then an added little benefit here of grazing is really taking away the how well this stuff burns. Uh, this was in another county a couple of years ago. This is a, you know the example of the one bad afternoon type fire. Starts in and among structures. It's going structure to structure. Firefighters can't mobilize quick enough. Firefighters are just focusing on getting people out of the way to save lives. This is that wind-driven fog fire. 
This is the fire that starts at the base of that, that hill that has 10 homes on top of the ridge. Um, that, that's a potential every year. To, and that, that would be uh, a, a really bad fire for those folks involved. This happened also in the grasslands of Sonoma County. And this is what I see happening more this year with the fog coming in, the afternoon fog push in the marine layer is these wind-driven grass fires in the afternoon. They're not long duration. You can see the timestamp here. They're usually over in a couple hours. Uh, grass usually doesn't produce a lot of embers. Grass usually doesn't produce a lot of sustained heat, meaning the grass doesn't burn for an hour and produce a lot of heat. It maybe burns for a minute or three minutes or less than 10 minutes, and then it, it it's out. And so I see the potential for this happening more this summer um, because of the way the grass has grown and just the afternoon winds we're going to probably experience with the fog coming ashore. Um, here's one from last year that started on 37 and ran towards San Pablo Bay. Um, within about an hour, it's done. It looked really impressive, really scary, but it ran into the bay. Um, this is the benefit of people having defensible space, having fuel breaks, having areas that are already burned. These fires burn into those areas and effectively they stop. You can see it's a wind, windy day, a north to south wind, um, but having that, that bay there um, stopped this fire. Another one that happened last year, same thing, but this happened in a populated area. All the firefighters were available, jumped on it real quick, and no homes burned. And basically, it was just a field amongst structures. But this is the scary, the one bad afternoon. This looks really scary. The smoke is not going straight up, so you know there's wind. You know the fire's being pushed by the wind. You know there's homes in this area. Uh, there's people probably in those homes. You know there could be potentially embers, but remember, less embers likely in a pure grass fire. But if this grass fire gets into trees, gets into like, let's say eucalyptus, could be a problem. So this is an example where we had the firefighters available. So it's not going to, it turned out to not be that bad fire. Um, here's an example. And I, I look at the cameras quite a bit or look at fires throughout the state, look at stuff. Uh, this is the grapevine, Kern County going into LA County. There's a, a mid-slope road here, fire road, access road. And that's where this fire stopped. It didn't stop right here in this area where there was retardant used, and it didn't stop right here. But this is the benefit of having vegetation modified, grazed, having a road to give access that also acts as a barrier, and then you know being able to have aircraft and other resources available to stop anything that spots over. Um, so just an example discussion point. This is another last year. This is one of the fires that happened in Sonoma County, um, and this is the the more of the fires that are normal for us. This is the one bad afternoon, starts Cloverdale uh, near the Mendocino County line. Down there at the bottom is our dispatch levels for Cal Fire. And this is when we talk about potential, I, this burning index number, when it gets up about 150, that's kind of a, a cue to me that things are ready to burn. Um, this is a national fire danger rating system derived number. Our spread component tells us how fast the fire will move at the head. This is in feet per minute. So 64 feet per minute would be that 64. And then our ignition component is on a scale of zero to 100, meaning that every ember that lands or someone flicks a match out, how many would start a fire? And so 88 means 88%, 88 of 100 would start a fire. So when we talk about potential probability, these are calculated every two hours by Cal Fire, determines how many firefighting resources were sent to the fire. And for this fire here that happened in Cloverdale, it was in the Mayacomas um, dispatch zone level, and it had a 66 for BI, a 21 for spread, and a 31 for the ignition component. And you can see it here before firefighters arrive from the Pine Mountain camera. All the firefighters are available this day. We had the extra big helicopter at the Sonoma County Airport. Uh, we get around it in about 15 acres, a little scary, but no homes in the area. A lot of aircraft just held it in place with retardant and water, and then firefighters got around it. But here's what it looked like the next day. It was in fog. So if we continue to have this moisture coming in at night, cool weather, fog coming in, and here, this is in North County, which normally doesn't get fog every day, it's only going to be the one bad afternoon. So... For the prevention folks or people that, you know, can talk to neighbors, please don't mow in the afternoon. Please don't have the ignition at the, at the wrong time. There's going to be plenty of other times in the day to do things at the right time. Um, so this is what happened in 2020, just too many ignitions at once. Um, 
everyone likes to focus on the Walbridge and Meyer and not the other 25 roughly fires that were able to be put out. And so this is, we just get outnumbered with the amount of ignitions and then resulting in, in acres burned from lightning, which was roughly 1.2 million acres in 2020. Um, so firefighter availability, another example here, this is down on the Napa County line with Sonoma. There's an extra helicopter at the Napa County airport. The fancy firefighter term is a CWN type one call when needed. So it's a contract, not a fire department helicopter. Type one is the largest copter. So a thousand gallons plus um, gets on this fire that was started by construction. It burns roughly 133 acres. So this is kind of the normal fire we put them out in four to six hours, the one bad afternoon type fire. Um, we know a lot about our fire history in Sonoma County. I, and I just wanted to point out, this is the Marshall fire from 2021. This, this trend we see in Sonoma County is not unique to Sonoma County. Um, the Marshall fire is in December in the winter drought. Uh, they don't get their normal snow, just like in 2018, Butte County didn't get their normal fall winter weather. And now it's November 8th and the campfire starts. So this is their one bad afternoon. The red there is strong winds. So they had winds up in the 60s and 80s. Starts in the grass. You can see the semi truck burned over that uh, tipped over there and eventually goes into the suburban area. And when you look at the weather leading up to that, every day was in a plus other than December 5th there, which had a negative 12 and December 10th, which had a negative seven. Um, so very warm, uncharacteristic, not 120 degree days. Normal would be, I think you see there 72 degrees and now it's 90 something degrees. So warm, drying out the vegetation, making it more available to ignite. This is all that potential probability for, you know, our, you know, when we talk about probability and potential, and then you get the windy conditions in the right spot. And it's off to the races, just like we've seen. So different part of the country, but similar phenomena. I don't know all about what's going on in Canada right now, but you know, fire follows these same principles. So we talked about ignition. Here's intensity. So how much heat is being produced, and that relates to how much vegetation is there, fuel loading, and that's why the winter storms with wind blowing down trees and also the snow just the grass, there's a lot more fuel loading this year, how it's compacted or arranged, that's a management function, how we maintain our vegetation, how wet it is, fuel moisture, and then how fastly it burns. And so you've seen me present this before, but this is our problem wind-driven fire behavior potential. So we can have fires, but as long as the fire stays on the surface of the earth and doesn't get up in the tops of the trees, uh, or produce embers, we're better off. So it, it's a fire, but it's not a destructive fire. So shaded fuel breaks, defensible space all help with this. Prescribed burning helps with this also. And then how fast it burns is based upon wind. That's the most dominant dry, driver of fire. We know fires historically here, wind-driven fires. How steep a slow is, because remember fire wants to burn uphill faster. And then the changes in the fuel type. Grass is our fastest. Uh, fuel type, timber, litter, the forest just been talked about is our slowest fuel type just because it doesn't normally get a lot of wind and moisture too, but it's a change in fuel type. So whenever we get wind on a slope or wind and slope aligned, that's our problem. So those wind prone slopes, a fire starts on that wrong day, that's our problem. And when you look at the Cedar Fire in 2003, the campfire, Everything just aligned just perfectly in wind and slope, and it was off to the races. So bringing it back to Sonoma County, what's our current situation? And this photo is a little bit old, but we still have a lot of green grass. We still have a lot of areas that are not ready to burn. Our shaded areas are still moist. Um, there have been many prescribed burns. Today actually is the first prescribed burn of the sun that I know of, and I know Pepperwood setting up to burn every a lot of prescribed burning that we did at this time last year, the year before has now been pushed later in the year because things aren't available to burn. So that's our current situation uh, because of my Internet and because of the time it takes this video link. I'll send the slides out to you guys. If you go to this video link, this is a, about a 19 minute video done by 
the northern region in Redding for northern um, California that talks about El Nino, talks about all the other little things happening. And really, um, it's not what the mainstream media is talking about, but really downplaying our fire potential or probability of having a bad fire this year. If you look at these predictive services that look at what they're saying. And this is what drives it is we're in a whole different situation now with our drought and how dry the vegetation is, how dry the soil is. So this is just looking at December of last year, 2022, to January of this year. So all the spring rains and everything else, you'll see a slide here in a minute, are all above and beyond this. But we are not in that dark red, red colored um, drought anymore. This is where it was a couple days ago. So I think we all know this from just watching things. I think there's some like Douglas fir trees that are dying in this county. And I have a, a picture of that coming up because of the, what's happened with drought, but at least we're coming out of the drought as far as when I walk in a forest, the soil is still moist. There's still below an inch or so, the vegetation's not available to burn, the accumulation of, of litter and such. So that's all good stuff. When we get multiple months of no rain, long duration, no rain, no precipitation, it just it makes more stuff available to burn, the large logs, but that's not the case this year. Those large logs have now gained moisture. They're, they're not as available to burn. Um, just because I, I live there, Lake Sonoma, here's a little comparison photo of Lake Sonoma in 2022 uh, versus during the snow we had back in February, just you know, showing you the status of Lake Sonoma and just you know, almost a tale of two, diff two different worlds. Uh, here's the snow survey. Um, you know, the year being that orange color, this is, you know, why some parts of California won't even burn right now in the Sierras. There's just too much snow there, and who knows if it's going to melt. And then, in addition to the drought, we're getting cool weather. So this is, you saw the calendar for Colorado for the Marshall Fire in December of 2021. Well, here's our, our May, just last month. Um, other than May 13th, which was the day we had fires, and I remember there were some medical aids because of heat-related illness type stuff, um, everything's been at or... I don't want to say well below, but below. So we get all this rain, grass is green. But we get out, get cool, moist, cool weather. Things don't dry out. Um, that's all helping us delay the onset of the summer fire season. So I can say pretty confidently, we've just taken away the month of June as a potential month where we could have a bad fire. How much of July are we... You know, if we keep getting cool weather through the rest of June, we're going to take away part of July as a potential period of having a bad fire. So that's going to leave us the remainder of July, all of August. And if we get early September rains or rains in September, now it's only a two to three month fire season or two to three month potential for a bad fire. So I think that's all trends that are in our favor. Um, here's even what's going on right now. This was issued a couple of days ago. This June loom, we're just getting cloud cover. The sun's not hitting the vegetation, the fuel temperature. Things are not getting dried out. Uh, this is why our prescribed burning in our forest right now are on delay. We, things are not drying out. So we're just getting very good weather that's helping our vegetation be less likely to burn. So less ignitions, less intensity, a great time to do prescribed burning. Here's our live fuels and we, it's not all encompassing our life fuels because we really, the species of that we care about or monitor is chemise, the brush. Um, and brush at 60%, which is the white line on the, on the graph, is when we call it critical, when it no longer is a heat sink, it's a heat source. And so the trend is with blossom and bloom and I don't know how my plant processes, but they gain all their moisture. They do their thing and then they go dormant as going into summer into fall. And so right now across the state, including in Southern California, the brush is taking on moisture, is retaining moisture. That's gonna make it less available to burn, less likely to burn catastrophically if it does burn. At some point, um, August sometime maybe, historically August, right? It's gonna drop below the 60% line and now become that heat source and be a problem. So this is just another trend in our favor that we're running behind 
on our live fuels, I think even grapes are running behind as far as uh, harvest, are running behind, so going to be less likely to burn. Taking away days of the summer, we can have a bad fire. Um, here's an example, a couple of things. This is an early season vehicle fire, early summer fire season. Um, Geysers Road in the Kincaid footprint, and it just doesn't burn. Burns a quarter of an acre. A very remote spot. Firefighters take half an hour to get there with the fire truck, roughly, and barely burns any of the brush because the brush has moisture. You can see the grass is green. We're not having these very, very warm days. And so that's all benefiting. So this is an ignition. This is a fire, but not a lot of acres, not a lot of damage. And you can tell by the smoke, most of it's dark colored smoke. So that's actually from the vehicle versus from the vegetation burning. So these next couple of slides get into more of the science of it. So this is the slide that I presented to the firefighters about a month ago. And on that day on May 16th, this is what the graphs look like. So I'm gonna take the time to explain these graphs because um, you'll see them in future slides. So in the lower left, it says a thousand hour fuel moisture in percent. This is our big logs, logs that are greater than three inches in diameter, our thousand hour fuels. And on these graphs, if you haven't seen them before, the gray line is the Did we lose them or just me? I think we lost him. We'll give him a moment. I'm telling you, mobile Starlink changes lives. Well, solid outlook so far, huh? Yeah. I will take that. I will take a late fire season. That sounds great. Amen. I love how Marshall makes it so clear that, you know, drought conditions and dryness and ladder fuels, of course, promote catastrophic fire. I mean, duh, it's like, let's look at our wind or weather patterns to inform fire risk. Yeah, I think he was really underlining a lot of the stuff about prescribed burning and uh, animals to reduce yeah. the vegetation. And, uh, you know, what a what a brilliant presentation. And uh, it's lovely to be treated as, uh, as CDF is with the updates. I'd like to ask who the phone number belongs to, uh, 2936628. That would be me, D. It's oh. still I switched to my phone. Okay, thank you. Oh, welcome, Jason. You just got in, huh? I was in another meeting. So I actually I have a know. meeting, so I think I'm gonna have to leave, but uh I'll be there, I'll be at the conference. I might get there early, help you guys hand stuff out, but I, I've got a an appointment with my doctor so i have to leave early so but I, we got good representation from sonoma resource conservation district we'll be there. <laughs> okay <laughs> um do we want to move on adriana to the conference and that's the next thing in the agenda let let uh marshall fight the fire now that you yeah, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. I think we did get a um we got the themes from him. I'll just text him and let him know that he can he can jump for today if he's uh yeah. So yeah, going into the conference, um, I guess just a couple and thank you everybody who's joined us who is not um concerned about the conference planning committee. You feel free to jump off. It's okay. Uh, Marshall, yeah. Marshall was the start doctor. <laughs> exactly. Um, All right. Well, I feel like I got my fill of 
planning for this yesterday in our, our meeting with Robert. So oh, unless you got Marshall anything for me, Adriana. Marshall might be back. Hold on. Yeah, I think that just a couple of main main takeaways are oh yeah, here is Marshall. Jason, I'm gonna send you and Robert an email today. I'd hope to do it yesterday, but with the you know, with the, the updates. Um so just you'll see an email from me later today. Great. Yeah, thanks for registering. So that was a big one is um, a number of people still haven't registered who are going to be coming to the conference. It's not because we need your money. You don't have to pay, but um, we just want you in the system so that we know you're going to be there and we'll have lunch for you and all that. So um, please do go onto Eventbrite, register. Um, like I said in the chat, we closed registration and opened up a wait list. And that's just so that we can control. We're pretty much at capacity for attendees. So we, we don't want any more attendees to come in, but we will um, take you off the wait list. If I see you committee members or first working group members, and we'll add you in um, as appropriate. So just make sure that you get registered there. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing was um, we are looking for volunteers still. Um, volunteer positions happen kind of throughout the day. You don't have to spend the entire day of Friday volunteering, but we could use volunteers on a couple of positions. Maybe they're in the morning registration or they're at lunchtime, just setting up lunch. So if you're willing to spend a little part of Friday doing some volunteering, please uh, send me an, uh, an email um, and Alex, if you think of adding him onto the email. Um, Adriana, do you have a a chart uh, that I could send to some of my friends because they they've uh, volunteered in the past and they may be willing to do it again. If I need to send them something. Yes, I do. Good. Yeah, let me let me put, pull that up and I'll drop it into the chat. We. Um... Oh, you know, I've lost the chat. How do I get it back? I don't know. It's gone. Uh, no chat. Okay. At the bottom of the screen, there should be a little chat button. I do, I do, I'll, I'll, I'll try to find it, but I, I've i tried that already and it's not working. Oh, there it is. Thank you. Hey, yeah. hey Robert, are you, uh, I know you're probably, you're waiting for that um, uh, summary for me um, and I'll send that when we're done here in a little bit. Um, yeah, so I had, um, was up for. no, I had another question. Um, so I know if this is an okay time to ask Adriana. Yeah, okay. go for it. Well, um, let's, let's see what Marshall needs to yeah. do. He's back, at least. Yeah, so. I'll, def I'll defer to Marshall. Well, do you guys want me to keep going? I'll, I'll finish it up quickly. I just. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, let me. We we're just we we're just hanging around waiting for you. You're the star here. Go ahead. I got to get better internet. I don't understand this. I'm at right looking at right at Mount St. Helena. Um, but that's another topic. Okay, are my slides back up there? Uh, just about. Okay. It's like it's warming up. Good now? Got it. All right, so I think what I was talking about was the 1,000 hour fuel. So I'm going to let go to take a time and just go over the ERC energy release component and the reason I wanted to talk about this is I've been really trying to define like what is our normal historical fire season. And so um, normally what I looked at was this red line on this graph is the highest ever. And this is for a large area, not just Sonoma County. So this is Sonoma, Mendocino, a little bit of Humboldt. And this is, if this was our highest ever, and this is our average line, which is gray, my theory is, and I remember back when I was a, a seasonal that would get separated from CDF in late September, early early October, around mid-September is our historical end to the summer fire season or peak fire season. Um, and if you take that same value back on the average, it's about the value of 40 on ERC, which would put it at June 19th, which is next Monday. And so this is our historical peak uh, fire season. Uh, remember red is the highest value ever, gray is the average, blue is the current year. And you can see while we did have some dryness in February, eventually we got good rains and we're running well below average. So this is the summer or multiple days are sustained where we could have a fire one day and it keeps burning for two or three days, which I've already talked about with, with the fog and stuff every night, we were less likely to happen. Once we get past that mid-September, if we get our rains in September like we did last year, 
the fire season is basically just okay it's a wind event we can have fires it's a it's an event fire season not a sustained fire season and that's because of the sun shortest day of the year cooling north aspect some areas just don't dry out again once we get that initial rain and uh -huh. so taking that graph up to this 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 time and uh well this first as an example last year um just as a recap if you guys remember we had that 115 degree weather pattern right around Labor Day, the first part of September. Yep. And then we had our first rain about a week later. And you can see that in September last year, the blue line, the current year in 2022 was setting the record. The blue line was above the red line. So 2022 set the record right here. But then we got the rain, which took the blue line well below average. And so it wasn't a, wasn't a problem. And so when we had the winds in November, and you'll see a picture of that, uh, it, it wasn't a problem because our vegetation had some rain. It wasn't another Kincaid fire. So this is our current values. Remember gray is average, red is the highest ever, blue is our current year, and now they, they've added a thing where they predict. So we're predicted to go above the average this weekend, Saturday, uh, but then we'll dip back down to average. So we're back on track of our average. So uh, next Monday, coincidentally, that's when Cal Fire just is packing all the trucks up on June 19th. Um, we're getting in, well, actually June 26th, we're getting into our summer peak fire season. And then if we get our rains like last year, we should be out of it mid-September. So updating it, that's how I look at this. Um, if we can get the, our rain events again in September and with El Nino, that's a possibility. Um, then we get these event or just wind driven events. So that's something new, a new concept I've been trying to develop, trying to define our historical peak fire season and why I think this year, if we've just taken June off the table as a bad month for fires, half of July perhaps, and now we get the rains, it's going to uh, really limit down the periods we can get a bad fire. And this is that example last year. We've got some really strong winds right around Thanksgiving, but because it rained before then, uh, the one fire that did happen, which was this fire up by Cloverdale, wasn't a big deal. Uh, one helicopter, uh, firefighters were there. They had Thanksgiving dinner or Thanksgiving on this fire, but it wasn't a big deal. It didn't come down the hill like the Kincaid did. It held up because we had that moisture. So that's that whole race about, is it going to rain first or is it going to be windy first? And then here's the big variable about El Nino. Um, and you're not seeing many people commit to what exactly is going to happen, but this is just the statistics of it. If you look at the bottom bullet point, um, it will likely affect our late summer or autumn weather with the enhanced probability, not saying it's going to happen, but enhanced probability of above normal rainfall. So I'm just looking at our weather now, going with a little bit of just, you know, an opinion here, but I think we're going to see early rain uh, this fall, which would be great because it would then shorten that fall fire season too. And then just to recap mentioned before, but here's our local factors with the snow damage. This is along Stewart's Point, Skag Springs Road, uh, trees falling. They're all now dry, so you can really drive this road and tell all about that. Uh, here's canyons uh, where the snow caused the trees to fall. You can see trees broken off here. Looks a lot different now because it's all dried out. Uh, this is our slide oaks. It lost a lot because they can't handle the snow at upper elevations. And then here's a picture of the dead Douglas fir trees that are you know, left over from the drought um, and now are starting to fall. Kind of look like anadel trees back when they were girdled when they first died. Uh, if you guys haven't seen some of the PG&E work that's happened, here's what PG&E is doing. I think they're going to come in and pick up some of these logs and things, but the, that's out there right now, too, to add to it. Um, I'm going to skip through some of this for the sake of time. Uh, review the red flag, just so you know if you hear about red flag and, and get to a slide about red flags. But we need our, our fuels to be dry, less than 6%. We need the grasses to cure. So really, we're not going to have red flags in June. Red, Probably no red flags half of July because our grasses are not cured. No rain in the last 24 hours. And then we need a combination of wind and RH. So the drier it is, the drier the air, the, dry, the lower the RH, the less sustained wind we need. And so that, that's what this graph shows here is that, um, sorry about that. If you've seen this before, it shows that um, if you got really dry conditions, daytime RH less than 9%, 
the winds only need to be six to eleven to trigger red flag. Um, once you hit moisture conditions, now you really need strong winds. And trivia in 2022, there was no red flag warnings. So maybe the same is going to happen in 2023. But when you look at this, this is a confusing graph. Um, I've showed it before, but you got all the years on the on the y-axis across the bottom is the months of the years and then you got this color gradation which just means the darker colors mean more red flag events in that month so no red flag events have happened between february and april since 2006 because remember our vegetation's moist normally in the spring we did have red flag warnings in the beginning of our drought years in 2014 we had three of them in january of 2014 that's when cal fire did a burn permit suspension in the winter. Um, here's in the 2013, a cave fire happened on Thanksgiving going into that drought. That's the windiest fire I've ever been on in my career, but no one I think really was paying attention because it was remote and didn't get down and burn any homes. The Valley fire happened to September of 2015 in Lake County, not on a red flag day. We had the sawmill fire, which burned the same areas as the McCabe fire on a red flag day in September of 2016. We all know about the tubs and the LNU fires in October 2017, red flags out. The Kincaid fire happens in November 2019. There was five red flags in that month. And then here we have the glass fire. The lightning didn't qualify as a red flag. They didn't put it as a red flag. Here's a glass fire that happened during red flag conditions. And look at this, October of 2020, we had six red flags with no significant fires. I think that's a lot about people being very safe. And so this is, you know, kind of all flags at the time of year. Normally don't have them in the spring. Um, how we're going to more of a year round fire season with red flags May through January um, and how they're distributed and how we, these directly correlate to fires that have happened um, in our county. Um, this is the Sonoma County fire history, the east to west moving fires. Um, here's the sawmill and the McCabe fire, the same areas burning over and over, um, but just showing the red here is Kincaid, just now with these bigger wind events and the vegetation being uh, drought stress, which we got a reprieve this year in 2023, but how the Kincaid burned a lot more area of the east to west moving fire scenario. But we do know these trends are not in our favor about the 50 year change in temperature, which you see here. Um, it's about ignitions and when fires happen. And so this is the prediction I made back in May to the firefighters. And we're starting now to see mower cost fires happening in mid-June. Um, those things are happening. So this is one way we can prevent having a bad fire or having that catastrophic fire. I don't know if you guys have heard about this no mow May, but I think that's also a variable. People aren't, um, and this is from back in Minneapolis or West St. Paul. Um, but that's some of the comments I'm hearing from folks, why they're not mowing in May, um, which that's fine. I have no problem with it. But if they're going to mow in, in June and July, just make sure they mow safely so they don't start a fire. But this might be why we're seeing less ignitions now as well. Um, and this is just to wrap it up, the initial observations um, that, I, that I'm seeing. So no significant heat waves or wind events to date and none being predicted. Our grass specifically has a high live fuel moisture, moisture in it. Our forest areas are still retaining moisture and our chaparral is trending higher. So we're just not drying, drying out the vegetation. So it's a heat sink, not a heat source. And so at some point that's gonna change, but I think it's gonna be less of our summer fire season, so less potential. So I think the probability is we're gonna have the afternoon fog, wind driven fires, Southern Sonoma County, more likely, Potentially those are gonna be those short-term destructive events. Can't mobilize firefighters quick enough. And the lot of fire in 2020 was an example. It burned into a stubble field and stopped. And you saw other ones in this presentation. Uh, these are the things to look for then when we have moist air down low, but dry air above, uh, nocturnal drying events. And you can see the dispatch levels. Remember the 160 value for the BI is what I look at roughly. So this would be dry air above moist air. Um, our nighttime, this is a national study about this nationally, the national trend or climate trend is we have drier conditions at night. So we may not, even though I think this year we're going to be able to stop fires at night, unless we have some catastrophic weather type event, 
that's what's also being seen nationally as fires are not always stopping at night like they historically did. So this year, I think we're going to get a break from this bad trend. Um, but that's what's happening at the at the at the climate change level trend. Um, this is the setup where we get our two weeks of heat. Um, I think that's less likely to happen this summer. But this is our heat wave scenario where there's a high pressure that comes in and sits over us. Um, we haven't seen that yet. So maybe we're not going to get this this year because of Nino and those. Um, and then open up the flood. There's a tie. We've had we had floods in 2017, we had floods in 2019, and we had bad fires those those years. A flood in 2023, so I'm hoping we can break the trend this year. Um, and so with that, this is my wrap up. All the stuff I've already talked about, just on one slide. And sorry for my internet today, um, but that's what I got for you guys. And thanks for being patient with me. Thank you so much, Marshall. And I'll PDF these slides for you guys and get them to you if you want. Yes. Hopefully, awesome. Thanks, Marshall. Hopefully I'm not wrong this year. Hopefully it's going to be another slow year. Marshall, um, can we ask a couple questions before yes. you go? Yeah. Okay, I'll kick us off. I, I have a question for you. How do you suggest that we take advantage of this kind of cool, calm, peacetime year and, and make a difference before, you know, um, we see drier, more extreme weather in the future? Yeah, I, that's a, it's a great question, and I when I see people getting as a little bit, we haven't had a fire year um, last year included. So um, I think it's a good time for people to look more at how their structures built, look at structural vulnerability, than defensible space. Maybe invest more. And I know it's money, but more time looking at that than managing vegetation because we seem to not focus on the structure as much because it's been about vegetation management. I think that's an important message. I think people should understand that it's okay to do prescribed burning in the summer months, as long as it doesn't damage tourism or grape or grapes or other industry that a prescribed burn is a year round tool. Uh, people hopefully can understand that. And then um, because we are going to get these afternoon conditions that are going to be dry, if people can do their mowing, whatever they're going to do that could potentially start a fire, do that when it's cool and moist, time it well. Um, so we're less likely to get ignitions. That's another thing I think people should understand as well. Um, but I'm hoping like for the mental health of everybody, including the firefighters, I don't want people letting their guard down, but I don't think we need to live in constant fear of having a bad fire. Um, you know, it's possible, but less likely, um, you know, every moment, every second we're alive or awake in Sonoma County. So hopefully that answers your question. It does, thank you. Any other questions for Marshall? I have some, but I wanted to send them in an email so it saves a little time for today's uh, meeting, but thank you. Thank you, Marshall, woohoo. Well, thank you, and this is bad timing because pretty much every day I think I'm busy trying to do something. <laughs> so if you guys wanna do another meeting or want me to come talk to another group, um, I'm good with that too. Just Thursdays are turning into very busy days for me, just the way it works out. Fine, 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 dear. We'll we'll honor that. Yeah, no worries at all. We're year out doing some really important work. So thanks for making time while you're out in the field on a burn to talk to us today. Thank you. I need to shout out that we should look up a Marshall on um on the web because he has won national, maybe international awards for his work, and we need to recognize that at the conference. It's fantastic. Yeah, we're lucky to have him. My opinion there is it's good to get, I guess, fame, but I don't want it because then just more people call me for help, and I just rather help you guys. So, <laughs> don't, don't. I'm get calls from like all over the now, all over now. And I, I want to help people, but it's hard. So I'd rather just help people in Sonoma County. Yeah. Yeah. Well, get some money to hire someone to help you. <laughs> yeah. I don't really believe in DNA cloning, but I'm starting to think that. I'm <laughs> we'll have the real one stay here, Marshall, please. You know. <laughs> Sounds like your son is walking in your footsteps too. So that's pretty awesome for us. Maybe we'll have more generations to come. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> hey, Marshall, can I ask one? Just curious yeah. on your opinion on this. You know, we touched on fine fuels, the veg is surging with that real wet winter we had. 
what are your thoughts on like broom control, right? Because invasives are having a big year. Broom is booming. The extended wet season kind of extends the pole season. But I think we can expect a surge in broom after all this rain, yeah? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And that's where I don't have a good answer. Um, because a lot of it's along roads, too. It makes it challenging to manage. So, and then uh, some of us have talked about this before. There's a right way and a wrong way and wrong times of the year to do things. And we're, we're missing those marks. So, um, you know, there's no easy answer. <laughs> but if we can find an answer, I'd like to be part of the solution. Um, but yeah, definitely that type of vegetation, now the invasives have started to um, take advantage. Mm -hmm. But it's, I mean, this is what's hard for me too. I'm, part of the reason I was a little bit late today is I'm dealing with Tulay Lake Regional Park with Sonoma County Regional Parks with Hattie. And we're doing the environmental review. And there's the thing now about the Western Bumblebee and its status. And it's like, um, and this year, it's probably going to be okay because there's so much stuff blooming but we're still having to mitigate for it. And so, I, I don't know, we just got to find some type of balance about how we can do things. You know, it's, it's hard trying to manage for one thing is what I'm saying, I guess. And so I, I don't have a solution yet. How, how about the broom and the other stuff? Yeah. I, I'd like to say uh, the solution is going to be broad and encompass a lot of specialties. Uh, the best broom control I've seen yet has been the gemelid moth which is a broom eating moth and wow. yeah and i'm going to be talking to uc about how do we get that as a commercial product because there are things like, that we can do like that it's like buying earthworms uh <laughs> you know so um yeah there's going to be a lot of new plants that we're going to be looking at and uh biological situations that we can use to control them deer are another good example yeah onward Hey, Marshall. Yes. Hey, Ryan. Hey. Uh, if Hattie needs a little help with uh, bumblebee issues, I've been looking at that too with the VTP. Just wanted to plug that in if she's looking for additional opinions on that piece. Honestly, we're getting too many opinions, but thanks, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm addressing it in terms of prescribed fire. I'm not sure if they are too, but um, there's a lot of good research that shows positive impacts on bumblebees, so. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. Remember, I'm a firefighter. I'm not supposed to do like environmental review stuff, but I'm learning a lot about these species and um, it's trying to make all the various documents mesh to where we can do prescribed burning. So in this situation, we've got an EIR that the County of Sonoma did. We got Cal Fire doing a BMP and then Fish and Wildlife is providing comments on bumblebees. And so it's just trying to make everything mesh well. And that's, that's, that's the hard part right now. Yeah. Well, the more you know, Marshall, the more you'll impress theologists. And I think that's a good thing. <laughs> you know, where the theologists come in as these nesting surveys and how that affects the implementation windows, right? Oh, yeah. So I'm seeing more and more this uh, get going in the fall right outside of the nesting season we're going to concentrate the fuel work from what september to uh fe february now i'm concerned about what's going to happen with all that equipment going in and turning up the wind in the height of the rainy season right so um, yep. it'll be interesting to see how all that shakes out yeah and that's what the i think the western bumblebee recommendation is to do it and do all the work in the winter mm -hmm. From a firefighting perspective, do you think that's good or bad? Did you like to, when would you like to see the fuel reduction work focused? Well, I mean, I mean, this has been my opinion that what what did what naturally happened? I think fires burned year round, so we we need to be doing burning in the summer. We need to be burning every time of the year. It doesn't have to, you know, doesn't have to be thousands of acres burning, but. I think we got to have the ability to to not destroy all habitat by fire, but as long as we set aside areas for habitat, we should, you know, manage other areas. And you know, I don't know. I have a feeling. I don't know this for sure. I know I've gotten stung on fires before by bees, so I know they're there. I I think they know to move maybe, and I don't want to kill any of them, but I also want to make sure they have suitable habitat. So that's where I'm 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 stuck because I think we should be burning year round. Um, 
but I also know we want to make sure they have habitat and there's, there's bees out there to reproduce too. So, you know, that, that's my two, you know, my opinion on it. Yeah. I mean, one plug I can put in for Cal Fire is uh, Ben or whoever made it happen. They're getting a lot of piles burned on Saddle Mountain heading into fire season. They're, I ran into the crew out there. They're burning 70 piles a day. Yep. It's pretty impressive. Yeah. Yeah, and that's up that message, right? We got to get people used to seeing smoke in the summer. It's okay. Yeah, we we already got some feedback yesterday, Marshall, when we were burning on the coast. So we're uh, we're exposing people to it. Good. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much again, Marshall, for coming. Um, I think we'll let you go and just wish you good luck on today's burn. Cool. Yeah, it's going well. There's already smoke, so hopefully the bees aren't mad. <laughs> Thanks, Marshall. This is, on, this is on Sonoma Land Trust property today. So the firefighters got about a 30-minute briefing all the, about the birds and the animals. So that was good. <laughs> so, all right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Um, thanks, thanks again. Thanks. Okay. All right. Um, let's... Let's uh, just wrap up. We have just about 10 minutes left. Um, we'll wrap up with some notes about the conference, some updates and requests. So like I said, if you haven't registered already, um, please do that. If you want to volunteer for a position on Friday in, in particular or Saturday, um, use the sign up sheet that I put in the chat. Um, like I said, volunteering, it doesn't take all day. You can sign up for a specific slot morning, midday we're like setting up um for the social hour there's a lot of small jobs throughout the day that we need extra help with and extra hands so um that's great if you're a speaker and you haven't registered um please do that and um like i said registration is closed currently but we will see you on the wait list and we'll pull you off the wait list and into real registration so you can get in there um and then um the other kind of uh big thing that I have to ask is that instead of our normal committee meeting next Thursday happening on Zoom, we're going to do it at Shown if Shown allows us. And Alex and I are looking into talking with Brianna, make sure that's all good. But we'd like to do it at Shown, have you guys there. We're going to assemble packets. We're going to assemble lunches. We're going to set up tables. We'll set, you know, hang signs. We might even do some like floral arrangements or something. We're going to get the space all ready. And, um, we could use as many hands as we can get. So, and we'd love to see you and kind of do this sort of like having a team building time together. So please um, uh, come to that. I have sent a calendar invite to the committee, um, but if you're not on the committee and you'd want to come, just let me know and I'll send that invitation to you. Um, it's just next Thursday at 11 at um, the Dutton Pavilion. So feel free to show up too, if you want to. Yeah, and part of the reason why we did that, you know, one was um, because we wanted to make sure, you know, we have these uh, packets put together. We're, we're not, there's not a, um, as much free time for people to go to the tables. And so we wanted to kind of have those things there. But also, as as Adriana said, to, you know, a little bit of a kind of bringing the team back together. Um, you know, J Jill had noted last time that, you know, hey, we, the way we used to do this is we would all meet together and we would kind of, you know, look at each other. And um, this is an opportunity to do that. So um, we really hope that people can come on Thursday um, to, you know, get a sense of excitement about that. You can also kind of see how things are going to be set up, um, get a little bit of a visual for it um, and uh, get a sense of what you're going to be doing on the next day. D. Yeah. Um I had requested a little bit of tech help on a couple of slides for my little three minutes. And you had, Adriana, suggested that we get together those that are involved in the plenary. And I sent you my dates, but I wonder if we picked one. No, we have not. That is a good thing that we need to do. So that would be you, Kim, Fred, um, Marshall potentially have a spot there too. But I think you, Kim, and Fred are the ones that we, in Sashi, of course, we wanted to get together to just kind of circle. Yeah, and I've separately been working on the on the panel there. Um, and uh, just, just uh, I'm glad you brought that up because I just wanted to, you know, kind of say we've got an hour for the opening plenary and we are cramming a lot mm -hmm. of stuff in there. And I, I think we all agree that the most important part of that is the landowner panel. So um, I am setting things up. I, I'm, I'm trying to really hold a good 40 minutes for that panel. So everything else has to fit into the 20 minutes. So there's not going to be as much time to, you know, for people to, you know, talk um, 
on that front. So, so that's just sort of the the background for that. But um, if we can set up a, a time um, to you know all kind of go through that, um, uh, you know that that other twenty minutes and make sure we have that really locked down, um, then uh, everybody will be sort of prepared for that. So I think. Um, it's a little bit of a different expectation. I think, you know, people have in the past said like, oh, okay, so do I need to present, you know, prepare 15 minutes of slides and nope, we don't have that kind of time. You know, we, we had a lot, a lot of expectations for, for the opening plenary. Um, uh, and, uh, we're just going to try to make the best we can out of that. Um, okay. Well, so three minutes, we had, three we minutes had, is all I need. What's that D? Three minutes is all I need. Okay, and also um, uh, that reminds me that um, you know Dee put together this really beautiful letter for the for the program, and um, I think that would be really nice to to share with the group um, when we get to that point. Um, yeah. Oh, and the other thing is that we have um, sort of this unstructured time at the end um, as we're closing up the the conference. Our closing plenary will be kind of like an audience shout out, like where you can say you know kind of what's on your mind or what you got out of the day. So right. that's another opportunity to. Um, kind of give your call to action or some other kind of message that you want to put. Yeah, we might, yeah, we, we might be able to do that then. Um, so that that closing time is going to be a facilitated kind of elicitation of feedback from the audience. We're going to get them to do the survey. Um, so it's not totally unstructured. I actually do have a, a plan for that. Um, but uh, uh, Dee, that would be a time to, you know, throw in a little inspirational call to action. You know, you know some of that may be good to do the, at that point as well. Um, I, but, will. No. I will. I will. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Ashi. It's it's less tightly structured than our plenary, which is like yeah. <laughs> very, but but yeah, it is still structured exactly. for sure. Fred. Um. Uh. I sent it over to Connor, the manager of the farm, regarding the Yakaama Indians, and they would like five to ten minutes. They. I don't know where that goes. Um, yeah, we need to talk about that. So they need to be whoever is going to be talking needs to be in that conversation that we're having there. Um, so right. um, yeah, because all, all we really had at the uh, we we we've um, as as you all know we we've really we've struggled a little bit with trying to get um, some uh, someone with some you know with a Native American connection to participate in the conference and to to be a part of that opening plenary, and we've tried so many different people and we finally you know I think you Fred you were able to finally get through to Yakaama we tried three different people at um SRJC we tried uh, you know uh, Clinton was unavailable they like so just letting you all know that there was a significant effort in multiple ways to try to get this to happen and I think it's just it's summertime and a bunch of things happen and we just didn't get anybody so um yeah so we'll we'll, we'll um we're great. Don't We've got minutes, yeah, but we can definitely get, get them in that conversation and, and, and make sure that it fits in. And Brianna got uh, Mary Churchill to um, put the land acknowledgement to do the land acknowledgement. No, she's uh, not available. Mary Churchill's not available. not available. Erica Tom is not available. Uh, yeah. Brenda Flies with Hawks hasn't re reached it, hasn't responded. So I have the uh, land acknowledgement, and either I will read it or it would be nice to get it in the program. Or both. Yeah, the land acknowledgments in there. Um, so uh, well, we, hold on we, to that. Uh, so the yeah. So um, we can when we when we have that meeting, we can talk about who's going to read it. Um, what we had at the moment, we had um, either we were going to have either Brianna read it or have Linda Hopkins read it. No worries. Um, and we can. It doesn't doesn't matter to me. Um, uh, and if somebody if if we wanted, we can either use their land acknowledgement or if Yakaama has something that that um, that they would prefer. Yeah, I, I think we're we're open to. Um, we'll yeah, talk. To that. Okay. Caitlin, did you have something? Oh, sorry, just saw you saw you come up there. Oh, and I just wanted to. I threw in the chat. Um, D and Fred, could you uh, look at my note in the chat and suggest some times that you might be available to meet next week? Thank yes. You. Okay. Um, other things for the conference. Um, um, I have a couple. Yeah, um, so I, uh, so I've I've been going through and um, you know it's a, a bit belated, but I'm kind of cleaning up some of the documents um because I know some of you've been trying to follow through um through the the folder that we had and there were a bunch of working documents in there that you know we worked through and then we kind of moved on and then it was a little hard to follow. So um, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, schedule mm -hmm. um. Or 
I've updated their, um, are you seeing this? No, that's the wrong one. We're seeing something. You see the schedule. Can you see the schedule? Yep. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So that's this is cleaned up now, um, so that you can see it. Um, uh, so uh, volunteers and kind of you know all hands on deck there at seven thirty. Um, we will have, uh, I believe it's 10 volunteers from the SRJC, you know, intern group. Um, they are going to, they're going to be one or two of them uh, with each of the cohorts. They will, um, you know, we'll kind of, you know, you'll, you'll have your person that you're going to follow throughout the day. They'll walk you through, you know, where to go. So they'll be the kind of wayfinders. They'll stick around for, for each of the sessions. So they get to actually participate and kind of hear the sessions. Um, and uh, they will kind of help people get get around. Um, they'll also be able to be there for anybody who has mobility challenges. They'll be able to kind of drive golf carts, all that. Um, so any other volunteers um, who sign up on Adriana's spreadsheet, um, you know, we'd meet at 7.30 and kind of you get your marching orders. Here's what's going to go on today. Here's where you're going to be. Um, and then uh, registration there at eight o'clock for half an hour. We've got the opening plenary there for an hour. Each of the transitions is 15 minutes. Um, and you know, that's the increment of this little thing on the side here. Uh, so then we have opening plenary, then we, uh, we disperse. So you, you, you start out, you're either in inside in the morning and outside in the afternoon or vice versa. Um, so you make one big transition at lunch. Um, and the other transition is a little bit smaller in between. Um, you go to your first session, which is each session is an hour and 15 minutes. Uh, 9.45 to 11, transition, 11.15 to 12.30, transition to lunch, and then, uh, which is an hour, which with the 15 minutes on either side, so it's a little bit extra time. Um, then session three from 2 to 3.15, session four from 3.30 to 4.45, closing plenary, 5 to 5.45, reception for about an hour after that, and then we work, work on cleanup. So that part can, you know, maybe it'll go till 7.00. Um, so that's the overall schedule. And then you can see by cohort, um, each and color, color coded there, um, everybody goes to registration, the plenary, um, and then you go to each of the four sessions and they rotate through and you can kind of see that here. And if you wanted to look at it by location, it's here also, and you can see what's happening in each of the locations at any given time. So the resource fair is gonna be at the writing arena. Um, and uh, I'll say that again for anybody who didn't, um, you know, wasn't at one of the last meetings. So we aren't gonna go in through the usual big glass doors. You're gonna go in through the writing arena. We're kind of forcing all traffic through the writing arena because that's where the tabling is. And we wanna make sure that people have, you know, little interstitial time to go in and see people at the tables. Um, and uh, because we don't have as much space in the schedule for people to sort of freely uh, wander around with the tabling. Um, so you're going to have registration in there. The tabling is going to be in there. Um, I think the breakfast snacks and things like that are going to be in there. So people are going to come in through there and then go into Dutton Pavilion from there. Um, so that's the writing arena that, uh, Dutton back, that back patio area where they have the wine tastings and things like that. That's where we're going to have lunch. And then Dutton Pavilion is that place that you're all used to, um, you know, the, the full room will be open. For the plenary and then there's a dividing wall that comes down so the the panelists and uh, the speakers for the opening plenary will be kind of standing in the front or so they'll be sitting sitting at high bar stools at the front where the wall is going to end up so it's a it's a little there's no stage or riser or anything um but we're, we'll have it they'll be on elevated stools so they'll be elevated up a little bit um and then uh then you then the other two locations are uh, what we're calling the Oak Turnaround and the Forest Classroom, which are just a little bit away down the road from uh, Dutton Pavilion. We try to make everything really close by to walk to um, the port. There'll be porta potties out there um, so that people are. No, my dog is ta tail is hitting a metal <laughs> trash can, making a bunch of noise. Um, so, uh, so this is by location. So you can, you know, you can take a look at this. It should be a little bit more clear to see. Um, and then uh, the other uh, <laughs> document, 
um, is here. Um, the day one sessions document um, had a bunch of working notes in it. Um, it's it's pretty cleaned up now. It should be a pretty easy, much uh, easier to kind of work your way through what we're doing and what we're not doing. Um, it has the kind of agenda of each thing, the description. Um, you can see at the end of the document, the bios are in there and I do need some bios for some, from some of you that are here. Brad D, I need some bios from you, Jill. Um, uh, and uh, Ryan, if you're still here, I need your bio. Um, do we access this through a Google Docs to add our bio? Yes. Okay. Yep. Let's put that in the chat. When do you need those? Um, in the next day or two. <laughs> um, we, we're going to, I think, um, um, Monday, I think we'll end up printing this stuff, uh, printing this part. Yeah, I would say if, if we can get it by like Friday night, we'll be in good shape. Yeah, 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 yeah. Alex. Um, okay. So, yeah, just wanted to, uh, let you all know that those were those were updated. Um, I'll put the schedule one in the chat too, because um, that might be a little easier for you to to get your head around. But we're yeah we're finalizing all the content for the uh, panels for the James Mina. Oh, how nice! Thank you. Um, uh, for the plenary, um, you know, getting all that stuff locked down this week, um, and uh, we'll be kind of ready to go. I, I'm, I'm, I think uh, maybe Alex and Adriana might have other updates, but uh, wanted to give you guys that. And um, the other uh, part of this cleanup, I wanted to make sure that um, by the end of this, that um, you have a folder that has, you know, kind of all the useful things in it that you might need for future conferences. So you can go back and look at it and that, you know, all the, you know, working things that ended up getting worked through that we don't need anymore are kind of cleaned up. So that will be hopefully uh, at the end be sort of tightened up um, and usable for the next round. Yay. Yeah, that's a good goal. I, I'm going to spend some time after the conference day um, cleaning up our files too for the future. I don't know if I'll get to it before then though. Um, yeah, that's obviously not the priority right now. Um, yeah. Oh, and then I, I would really like us to share Dee's letter. I don't know um, who would be the best one to do that. Yeah. Um, Dee, do you want to send out your final letter to the group? Or can we screen share it? I guess, or do you want- Can you just put it in the link? I mean, nobody, we need, they can read it if they want to. <laughs> or they'll see it in the program. Yeah, <laughs> everyone will have it in the program for sure. And I know we're a little over time, so um, maybe for those who want to stay, who want to stick around, um, Alex and maybe Sashi, uh, we have a, a meeting right now just to keep going with the details of the conference. If anyone wants to stick around, you're welcome to. I have a question for the group that I'd like to pose, um, but those who need to hop off, um, absolutely do so. Uh, my question is, we're still putting together the packet for every attendee, and you have the opportunity to slip in some kind of like short one pager document that you feel like is really salient for the for every attendee. Um, if you have something like that, send it to me um, by tomorrow and we'll get it printed on Monday. Um, for example, I've got a flyer coming up for some workshops at the RCD. Eric um, has a flyer coming up for the handbook saying like coming soon. Um, is there anything else that people would like to put in there that every attendee would get? I'd love to get a really short version of some of the projects that are going on, like uh, like the Diamond Mountain Mark West, Lynn. I'd love to just have a little, and I'm sure there are others, but uh, you know, I'm so curious uh, and, and excited about what you all are doing. So there you go. That's a great idea. We just have a really quick turnaround time for something like that. If, if you're able to get it to me by the end of day Friday, that would work. And we'll put it on Monday or sometime over the weekend and we'll print it on Monday. Okay. Should it, it should be eight and a half by 11, like a standard page size or. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for asking. All right. Um, and just email that to me. Um, and I will include it. And if you can, anytime you send anything to me that has to do with the conference, please also 
um, put Alex on there. Alex, could you put your email in the chat um, so people have it? That sure, be you bet, yeah. Thank you. Um, and so I see, Jason, you said Molly has something uh, from WRA that she'd like to print. Also, low I go. CAD. Yeah, uh, we have one that, that's kind of cool because it shows, you know, community resiliency, everything from uh, funding to implementation. So I think that'd be a good one. Could you ask her to send that to me? Or totally. can you send it? To me? Okay, great. Totally. All right. I should jump to you guys. Have a lovely day. Thank you. You too. Um, I think Tori um, had mentioned a, I know we were looking at videos from UC about forest stewardship. If there's a single page flyer, that's great too. Tori, you actually might have emailed me something. So sorry if I missed it. Um, I can look back through my emails. Yeah, I have that. Okay. Yeah, I <clears throat> emailed it a couple weeks ago and it's the same one. So oh, if you have it, then I won't resend it. <laughs> great. Yeah, we've got that one. Um, I just need to get... Um... I got Jason's bio. I need um, yours and Jill's just like a little three or three or four sentences. I'll, you can just send me what you have and I'll tighten it up, which is what I've been doing for everybody. Okay. I'll send that today. Thank you. Fred, Fred, I need one from you too. Hey, Adriana, can we just talk real quick about the from. tabling? Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's do that. And also I was going to say, Robert, if you, um, if you want to, if you have time to put together a little permitting page, one pager, that's a great addition to the pack too. I understand if there's not time for that, but if you can, that's great. Yeah. I just, I wasn't able to work on it yesterday to get it to you. So I can take a look at the one you did and just gussy it up a little bit. Okay, great. So yeah. Um, changing gears. Uh, Robert had some questions about tabling and what all is included in tabling, like what role the tablers will have, what kind of materials they need to bring, um, and um, what they need in, in terms of supplies. Mm -hmm. And Alex, you can help me answer this question. Um, but essentially, I think um, tables will be provided as well as chairs. It's a six foot table. It's an indoor tabling space. Um, we would like for tablers to bring kind of like relevant resources for the audience, um, useful things that they're going to take home and take action on, business cards so that they have a person they can reach out to, the person that they talk to at the table would be great. Um, what else am I forgetting? That's pretty much it. Um, we have very limited electrical outlets. So if that's uh, kind of mission critical for your tabling setup, please let us know ahead of time. Um, if it's not mission critical, um, maybe don't count on electricity. <laughs> okay. Um, but uh, we can make that happen if it's if it's needed. Um, there, there are those yeah. those iPads, um, which is that was the the workaround for that. If you um, the there are forty Shown Farm iPads um, that uh, will be fully charged up and connected to the Wi Fi, mm -hmm. um, so uh, tablers could could use those if they need them. Okay. Um, as far as like signage, is there any, I'm assuming we should bring our own signage. Is there any restrictions on signage or anything like that? I'm just thinking of past are conferences, you, stuff I've had to work with. Yeah. Are you talking about like uh, backdrops? That kind yeah, of thing? things like that. Yeah. Are the things you don't want us to bring? No, I, I mean, I think um, all of that would be fair game unless um, somebody else feels otherwise. Um, we don't have table drapes, okay. um, so if you if that's something you can bring or um, you feel strongly about, please please bring that. The tables are perfectly nice tables, but um, be good to bring a drape if you uh, if you feel so inclined. Um, but yeah, we don't have anything in terms of backdrops or signage. No no issues there. Okay, great. Yeah, Thank you, you. Can, you can make it look as festive as you want because that's <laughs> really only, I think, like 15 or so tablers. So there's, you know, we want you guys to look, you know, um, to look festive and fill up that space. Um, and I had another thought about that, which was um, the role of tablers. So um, we want everyone who's going to be, every person who's going to be tabling to register as a tabler and let us know if they're tabling and not register as an attendee. Because if you are registered as an attendee, we are going to put you into an attendee group. 
you're going to take up a seat in a group. Um, and if that's if you're not going to be in the groups, then we don't want to accidentally put you in groups. So just make sure that you're all signed up as tablers. And um, then the other part was um, tabling will be most active in the morning during registration and like right before the plenary when all the attendees are coming in and filling the space. It will be very active at the last uh, 20 minutes of every session when the permitting, planning, and funding um, group comes in to the to the mm -hmm. arena and walks around. It'll be active at lunch and it'll be active at the social ha um, happy hour at the end. So um, we're asking everyone to come early, stay late because we've got time for activities all the way throughout. Um, and then there's going to be like lulls in between um, when the sessions are in full swing. So just so you um, have that expectation set. Great. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Um, and then, sorry, one more thing. Sash, Sashi, I, I saw my my bio was a little sparse. Would you like me to add to it or um, give you a little bit more? Would that be helpful? Yes, please add okay. to it. Yeah, that, that was literally, that was, I just took that off your LinkedIn page. <laughs> Great. Sounds I was trying good. to build things for people I didn't have, you know, like, yeah. so I, I like, you know, yeah. Okay. Um, Great. You know, just you keep it like, you know, three, four sentences, something like that. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everyone. And thanks, Fred. I put yours in. No worries. Hey, um, did we ever find beer? Um, no beer. No, wine and margaritas is what we're working with now. Wine and margaritas. Do you want me to pursue the beer angle? Are we, are we happy? I think we're good. I think we're, I think we're good. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're going to have plenty as is. So, um, okay. I just, yeah, I'm just, we're probably just working on my own list here. Okay. See you. Thanks, Fred. Okay, well, great. Um, um, can we, can we, um, uh, I think D already left, but um, uh, maybe we pin down a time on Monday. Um, yeah, she, she private messaged me. I will um, put in and her. And then we just need Fred to get the Yaka Ama person who's going to come to the conference to be at that meeting. And that means I'm getting Connor, who is representing that person. I mean, it's all so third stage i'm working on oh that. oh oh okay but i'll talk to connor before that okay okay See? yeah that, that yeah you... whoever whoever it is um yeah i just if there anybody who's going to talk at the plenary has got to be at that thing or or it's not happening besides linda hopkins who I the, the time that. of that meeting is well uh we are still scheduling it you said that you're open anytime on monday d is open um in the uh let's see nine to sorry i'm gonna have to find her thing but it also comes down to when kim is available and kim is on vacation right now so it may take a take a second okay uh, d is available nine to ten three to four or after 5 30. and so. i'll do what i can with uh yaka ama and connor but my experience has been it's a little more free for me okay um yeah uh nine to ten three to four i can do yeah and then i have a little thing in the middle and then something in six but nine to ten or three to four sound good for you sashi okay and that works for for friend we'll just ask i'll text cam and we'll nail that down soon um it sounded like he was pretty open on monday i i, I don't recall but um yeah cool oh my gosh it is right around the corner getting oh, i can't believe it. um but it's off. really it's looking good you guys I, you know this is it's i think it's going to be a really Good conference and we have had a really good team and good committee and people everybody has really stepped up and we really appreciate everybody's hard work on all this yeah ditto <laughs> okay oh, you know what actually i should throw this out um because I, I i i it's this keeps popping up in my mind i keep not mentioning it um uh anybody has a good press democrat con uh, contact because we should just tell them we're doing this um otherwise we can just email um you know the news uh email thing yeah uh, what isn't it margaret callahan who does this i don't know um they've got somebody there who covers environmental issues and that would probably be the, the place to go in and their email is at the bottom of their articles so uh i'll be looking for that Sashi. okay that'd be great yeah thank you i can go pull out my paper and take a look too but yeah if you if you I figured I figured someone would know who the regular the regular person was. Well, I, I've also been in the woods with a few of them, so I don't. Oh, good. Like, yeah. 
Yeah. If you, and if you do the personal reach out, that's always better. You know, like, Hey, we're doing this conference. We, it's sold out. Hey, um, there's some it, great pictures to take. Exactly. I mean, that's it. They're always looking for that stuff, right? Like we wouldn't, you know, <laughs> okay. It's really nice to have that as an article following, like, you know, oh, look at all this great stuff. Yeah, yeah. Look what the JC is doing. Look, yeah. here we are in the woods. Here's, here's an 80 year old lady with a uh, loppers or a chainsaw perhaps. So Fred, is it Guy Kovner that's doing that work ever? Cause he's who I used to talk to for sudden oak death kind Eric, of stuff. Eric, really quick. Sorry, before you go, I, I'm sorry. Yeah. Cause I saw no, you. No problem. Can I just ask him a question? Eric, yeah. are you all good? I haven't replied to many of your emails. I'm sorry. Do you need uh, No, that's, a, that's okay. I think just um, the tabling, we kind of have three people with myself, Ellie and Caitlin. It's, uh, and we're hoping still to kind of coordinate to like just have a little bit of a spiel in front of a couple of the um, speakers, but I ha everyone's been very busy, so I haven't necessarily heard back. Um, um, well, I, I can tell you, so so what we're doing in that planning, permitting, and funding session, um, we are cutting that session short to walk them in to the resource fair. Um, okay. And uh, so they, they'll be like, you know, 15, 20 minutes, and then there'll be the 15, 20 minute break. Um, so uh, that will be the the time um and uh you know we can try to we can try to try to work it out um uh, i think if we have you guys have a dedicated chunk of that time then everybody else is going to want to do that too but I agree. you know we can say we're walking you in here here are the you know speakers um and uh Alex, I've, I've been also meaning to ask, um, were we planning on having a printed list of who the tablers are? Um, because we could hand I, them people yeah. that and say, like, this is who is who's here. Yeah, I think we were talking about doing kind of a overall contacts. Um, we can have like tablers, speakers, um, kind of anybody who folks might want to be and, in touch. And with. Eric, are, have you already given us a flyer to put in the packet? Yeah, yeah, I sent it out yesterday to to Alex and Adriana. Um, okay, so then that'll be there to you know for anybody that'll wrap up anybody who you didn't get to talk to personally. Yeah, that's that's perfect. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind, um, I'm on my phone right now, so I I can't write this down. But just sending a quick email about that that timing space. Um, okay, that would be incredibly helpful. Um, yeah, so that all sounds good. And then Adriana, we talked a little bit about maybe getting um, a few minutes at the beginning of each of the field trips and sending an individual. Is that still acceptable? um yeah you know, just need five minutes yeah i um maybe not the beginning because that will be the time for the host to introduce them themselves but um but i will work with alex to communicate to the field hosts that um we're going to be working that in i think maybe a good time to do it would be at the very end of the lunch break because then people are coming Perfect. together they're you know they have a little wiggle room they can listen to something else and then they'll continue with their hike or whatever i think that yeah does that, that sounds sound perfect yeah we're totally we're totally open just trying to like get people excited and this is obviously if you have 150 plus people signed up like uh a good takeoff board um so yeah we'll take whatever we can get and thank you so much so the um you are signed up for which tour so i'm signed up for the gold ridge i think um ellie was signed up for pepperwood and caitlin was signed up for uh or maybe it's the other way sorry ellie was signed up for um saddle mountain and and caitlin for pepperwood and we have one other person mary lee Le Guin, who's already signed up but i was gonna see uh she recently tore her acl i think so uh we might just miss out on one of the field trips yeah. Yeah. okay got it and so you're you're at green valley is that right uh, I thought I was, I thought I was at the, uh, the coast. Coast Ridge. Oh, I thought you said Gold Ridge. Okay. Coast Ridge. Oh, yeah. I did say Gold Ridge. I was wrong. Sorry. No worries. You okay. are, you're on coast. Yeah. I see here. All right. And so we'll just, um, I'll just tell each of them, Hey, expect, you know, Eric wants a few minutes at the end of uh, lunch at Coast Ridge. Ellie wants a few minutes at the end of lunch at Saddle Mountain. Caitlin wants a couple, okay. couple minutes at the end of lunch at Pepperwood. That's amazing. Yeah. That sounds, that sounds above and beyond. Thanks y'all. Awesome. All right. Cool. Yeah. Uh, look for, looking forward to it. Great job, everyone. It's really exciting to see it from the outside, like coming from like just an idea and, and how y'all have put it into practice. So keep it up. Thank you. Appreciate it. Have a good one. All right. Okay, cool. Well, um, Alex and I now need some time to do our work. So we're going to go into that unless anyone else has something pressing to do and you're welcome to stay if you want to just listen in, but 
Um, since she's here, uh, Sophia had asked about volunteering, and um, Adrian, I wasn't sure if you wanted me to to, to handle handle that. Um, but um, you know, Sophia, we've got um, uh, that document that um, Adriana sent out with the what the volunteer opportunities are, and you're welcome to kind of slot yourself in on all that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. and did you see my... up with you? Sorry about that. No problem. I I know everything. There's lots of cats to herd. I get it. <laughs> I've been You're there. <laughs> you are important cats to us. And did, did you get my invitation for the Thursday at show? Yes. And I think I did reply yes for the, so it's a week from now, a Thursday, 11 o'clock at shown to help with pre-setup and everything we were doing there. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, and Steve, are you going to be, are, are you, are you coming after all or not? I, am I muted? No, I'm good. Um, I am coming on Thursday. I will be there Friday morning to help out with uh, the one I have to leave Friday afternoon. I, um, so I will not be there Friday afternoon and I will not be there on Saturday. Okay. And is Tori from, uh, do you know whether Tori is okay with uh, helpers? I checked in with her. Um, we check. need to d d double check. Um, I believe that with... Um, potential for Michael in the afternoon and with Jill and with Jason Mills. And uh, we hadn't, I need to check up on, on everybody there um, and make sure everybody, but um, Jason's planning on being there as far as you yeah, guys know. Jason's, Jason's like an official co-presenter. I think Jill is also listed there. Yeah. So um, she's going to be fine as long as she has all of those people. Um, okay. And then there are also the the shown interns um, who can be roped into. I know she wanted to break people into smaller groups. She did. Um, That's yeah, the main so concern. She, she needs, be roped she needs like three. She needs at least three people, including her. So she's going to need at least two assistants for yeah. all of her okay, so then we're sessions. Fine. Okay. And then um, I, I really apologize. I had um, an important uh, commercial client come in at the beginning of this meeting and I had to spend some time with them. So I missed some stuff. But um, where are we on registration? We're, We're full, good. right? We're all full. Yeah. We're all full. Okay. So I don't need to worry about that anymore. Um, did Sophia already talk to you guys about vans and whether she needs to bring a van on Saturday? No. No. I did not bring it up because I didn't know you guys needed one. <laughs> well, I just wanted to double check and make sure that everybody had all the vans they need and, and figure that out. Do we need to bring the UCCE van up to this on Saturday? I think if we had an easy option, we would take it. We calculated, I forget the exact number, but we had 80 seats or 85 seats, something like that. Um, and they will presumably all be full. And then we're just going to have the rest of um the participants you know carpooling and stuff yeah so okay. if we can have another van i think we'd take it but, so uh, sophia's oh well i you know what sophia you had your spiel so i'll just let you handle that I, the the reason why i was maybe not going to do that is i'm seeing about spending the night up north i have a friend that lives in forestville so that i and i'm not sure if i would be allowed to bring you know if part of it is personal use does that make sense going back and forth sure things like that what I what, what i I'll might talk to suggest and... yeah I, I don't think it's going to change anything on our end we're not we're not renting vans we're not going to try and fill that gap so i think if you could bring it um that would be helpful just in, in terms of the spirit of the conference getting people together less emissions all those good things also if you couldn't for whatever reason it doesn't change anything so yeah um, okay yeah sounds good and yeah. unless um, somebody else feels otherwise, I would be fine with, you know, let us know what, what ends up happening um, in which we're not going to, like I said, change anything either way. So um, just uh, keep us in the loop, but don't stress it. All right. Thank you, Alex. Okay. I'll let you guys talk and talk shop. Thank let you know. for filling me in there. Um, and I'd like to be a fly on the wall. So I'm going to, I'm going to stick around just because it helps me figure out what the heck's going on. And, um, and then I, uh, and then I'll probably have to go cause I have to prep some samples for shipment. So okay. Okay. bye. It's coming together. See you bye. guys next Thursday, yeah. if not before. Thanks. All right. Uh, Tori just emailed that, um, there's a uh, forestry 